Good morning. At this time, will sergeants please start their recordings? Recording to the computer and comment on the way. Thank you. Cloud recording is up. Thank you. Backup is rolling. Thank you. And Sergeant Lugo with your opening statement. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearings of the committees on hospitals jointly with health. At this time, would all panelists please turn on your videos. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices to vibrate or silent. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chairs, we are ready to begin. Good morning. I am Carlina Rivera, chair of the New York City Council's Committee on Hospitals. And today the Committee on Hospitals is joined by the Committee on Health and my colleague, Chair Mark Levine, to conduct oversight on hospital costs and the impact on access to care. And I'd like to acknowledge that we have been joined by council members uh, Moya, Holden, And I'm sure that we will be joined by others along the way. I see Council Member Powers and Ayala. So good morning again. I'm Council Member Carlina Rivera. I am Chair of the Committee on Hospitals. I want to thank you all for joining us today to discuss hospital costs and access to care. Health care costs are under constant scrutiny and for good reason. The United States spends more on health care than any other country in the world. In 2019, the United States spent 17.7% of its total GDP on health care, totaling $3.8 trillion or over $11,500 per person. I'd like to repeat that total again, $3.8 trillion. This is an incredible figure. And while the United States has some of the best healthcare facilities and doctors in the world, we also have the highest prices, largest cost sharing for patients, and still we do not have the best health outcomes. We do not have universal health coverage and people still experience barriers to care. So how did we get here? Healthcare financing is an extremely opaque and complex topic, an issue that spans over a century. For much of the U.S. healthcare system's history, insurers and providers, including hospitals, were allies. Blue Cross and Blue Shield, the nation's largest health insurance system for 50 years, was formed in part by the American Hospital Association and was in part run by state medical societies affiliated with the American Medical Association. This directly impacted cost. Providers sent generous rules of payment. Blue Cross and Blue Shield made the payments without much pushback, and commercial insurers usually follow the same payment rules. This helped fuel rapidly rising health care costs, which were not critically examined until the 1970s. Starting then, various and numerous cost control measures took shape. Nowadays, there is much tension between providers and insurers, as well as businesses who wanted more affordable health insurance options. All parties want competitive markets to keep their patients or enrollees happy and to keep their own respective costs down. What remains is a pricing system that is unregulated by the government and largely kept out of the public eye with prices varying greatly depending on the location, as well as the type of insurance a person has. So this led to recent federal regulations ordering hospitals to publish a complete list of prices that they negotiate with private insurers. And although most hospitals have ignored the rule, the data that is available confirms what has been reported and studied for many years. Hospitals charge patients very different amounts for the same basic services. The data shows that insurance coverage and which hospital one receives care in can shift costs by thousands of dollars. Notably, there are several examples of major health insurers, including some of the world's largest companies, 
with billions in annual profits, negotiating unfavorable rates for their customers, with instances of insured patients receiving care that is more expensive than if they would have pretended to have no coverage at all. A study by the 32BJ Health Fund analyzed data from hospitals in the greater New York City area, and they found that the majority of them failed to fully comply with the new regulations. And while New York City Health and Hospitals was the most compliant, private nonprofit hospital systems, including Mount Sinai, Montefiore, Northwell, New York Presbyterian, Memorial Sloan Kettering, and NYU Langone, were less compliant or fully non-compliant. In fact, no hospitals within the Northwell, Memorial Sloan Kettering, and NYU systems reported their prices. Despite many hospitals' lack of compliance with the federal rule, we know that there are significant differences in overall price levels among city hospitals, even those of similar sizes that provide similar services, regardless of the health status of the population served and the complexity of the services provided. What we also know is that high costs directly impact access to care, that affordability and access are intertwined. In 2019, about one in 10 adults reported that they delayed or did not get care because of costs. Delaying or foregoing medical care because of costs disproportionately impacts those who are Hispanic and Black, with 15.1% of Hispanic adults and 13% of Black adults reporting delaying or foregoing care, compared to 9.3% of white adults and 4.8% of Asian adults. These racial disparities tie into other health inequities, such as insurance status and health status. Even though health insurance can provide protection against unexpected costs, Insured individuals can be impacted by high levels of cost sharing and increasing premiums. This oftentimes leads to an individual or family being underinsured. So people who are underinsured have high health plan deductibles and out-of-pocket medical expenses relative to their income, and they're more likely to struggle paying medical bills or to skip care because of cost. In 2019, 12.4% of all insured adults reported difficulty paying medical bills. At least one-fourth of insured adults report difficulty affording their deductible, the cost of health insurance each month, or their co-pays for doctor visits and prescription drugs. So this is why we're here today, to critically examine hospital costs and how that directly impacts people who need care. The figures I've highlighted are completely unacceptable. And as a city and as a country, we should strive for a more equitable, affordable, and higher quality healthcare system. I look forward to our robust discussion and I would like to thank the hospital committee staff, Council R. Harbani Ahuja, policy analyst M. Balkin, finance analyst Lauren Hunt, and data analyst Rachel Alexandrov. I also want to acknowledge that we have been joined by other members of the council. That includes council members Dharma Diaz, Inez Barron, and Sylvina Brooks Powers. I will now turn it over to my co-chair for remarks. Chair Levine. Thank you so much, Chair Rivera, for that excellent opening statement and your leadership on this issue. Again, I'm Mark Levine. I am chair of the City Council's Health Committee, and I'm pleased to be jointly chairing this hearing this morning. The alarmingly fast rate of increase in healthcare costs has been a source of enormous concern for years in New York and nationally. We held a hearing on this exact topic three years ago, and it remains more pressing than ever. The US spends more per capita on healthcare than any other developed nation, and will soon spend close to 20% of its GDP on health. It's not that Americans are buying more healthcare overall than other countries. It's the it's that what we are buying is increasingly expensive. Today in this hearing, we want to focus on a key driver of this vaccine problem. The fact that some healthcare providers in the city stand out with costs that exceed even the already high rates of their peers. Recent news coverage and several studies have shown that costs for similar or even exactly the same procedures can vary widely between diff different hospitals in New York City, in the same borough, or even just a few blocks away from each other. And what's worse, despite the recent change to federal law 
requiring more transparency. There is also major discrepancies between hospitals in terms of how upfront and transparent they are about the cost of the services they provide. This hearing will explore the extent to which costs are being inflated by the opaque way hospitals price their services, a problem exacerbated by the hidden details and agreements between insurers and providers. And we will seek to understand why some hospitals are complying with the federal hospital price, price transparency rule, rule, while others are not. We will also examine the extent to which rapid consolidation of the hospital sector in New York has accelerated the trend toward price increases, with the largest systems now acquiring such strong negotiating power that they can block insurance contracts that steer patients to lower cost providers. The wealthiest New Yorkers can afford the most expensive care, but for working people, runaway costs are inflicting a heavier and heavier burden. This is particularly true for workers and their families who receive their health coverage from a labor union health, health fund, where higher health costs inevitably lead to lower salaries. To that, to that end, we are very concerned to learn that recently, labor union with over 200,000 regional members was forced to drop the entire New York Presbyterian health system from its network because of the hospital's ballooning pricing. For reference, the union's fund paid on average 358% more than Medicare for the same services across the hospital system's facilities. What could possibly explain such inflated costs for services? So we have some high stakes questions to explore at this hearing. And I very much look forward to our discussions and thank you all for being here. I look forward to hearing from the Greater New York Hospital Association, as well as our labor representatives and representatives from the state insurance plans. I wanna turn it over now to our hearing moderator in Balkan to review some procedural matters. Thank you. Um, thank you, chairs. My name is M. Balkan. My pronouns are they, them, and I am the senior policy analyst to the Committee on Health and the Committee on Hospitals for the New York City Council. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify when you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. I will periodically announce who the next panelist will be. We will call on individuals one by one to testify and each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. After I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you. There may be a few seconds of delay before you are unmuted, and we thank you in advance for your patience. Please wait a brief moment for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom. I will call on you after the panel has completed their testimony in the order in which you have raised your hand. And as a reminder, all hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. I would like to now call on our first panel to testify. Um, so I would like to welcome David Rich, followed by Leslie Moran. David, you may begin when ready. I am, I am, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry, and oh, I, I yes. don't know if Chair Rivera is okay with this, but uh, our assembly member, uh, Catalina Cruz, has to leave momentarily. If, if it's okay with Chair Rivera and, and Mr. Rich, I'd love just to let her very briefly deliver some remarks. Are you okay with that? Okay, thank yeah, absolutely. you. Absolutely, that's the plan. Thank so, you. So uh, assembly member, yes, please take it away. Thank you. Um, I wanna thank you all for having me uh, joining you today. I think the, the rising cost of healthcare is something that pertains not just uh, the folks at the local level, but those of us at the state. And I, you know, and I hope that our federal uh, counterparts are listening. I know they passed uh, legislation to force the hospitals to do the right thing, but it hasn't worked. Unfortunately for the hospitals, it is more profitable to continue to bill our community members exorbitant fees and, the, and increase uh, the insurance while they paid the $300 uh, fine as a cost of business. Um, I happen to represent uh, Jackson Heights, Corona, and Elmhurst, which are communities that were hard hit by COVID, um, where the cost of health care um, is something that we feel every day. I myself have been hit with $12,000 uh, bills, even though I'm insured. 
board. And uh, we are here today because the insurance companies uh, have tried to work with the hospitals. The unions have tried to work with the hospitals. The government has tried to tell the hospitals what is the right thing to do. And they're obviously not listening because our community members are still having to make choices between uh, what to pay. Do I pay for my health care? Where do I choose to get that health care? And even what insurance to have. You have a hospital like New York Presbyterian where you can have one procedure be built in three different ways to three different insurance companies. And we're talking $20,000, $30,000 difference. And it's because these companies, these corporations that we call hospitals, have chosen to make money out of healthcare, have chosen to make money out of allegedly saving lives. And yes, they're saving the lives. But I say allegedly because when you get a $200,000 bill that you have to pay or when you have to choose between a world-renowned doctor at one hospital versus a decent doctor at another one, you're playing with your health care. You're playing with your life. So we at the state level are going to be joining or have already joined this fight for our community, for our consumers, for our health care uh, by pushing the HEAL Act. This is an act uh, that is going to make sure that these exorbitant fees that none of us are privy to because hospitals keep it under wraps become something that's public, that we are forcing the hands of the hospitals to do the right thing, to make sure that we get the choice of where to go as a, as, as a consumer, as a patient, um, which insurance to use, which hospital to use, and not be forced to choose our healthcare based on what we can afford. That's not the kind of country we should be. That's not the kind of country that I want to be a part of, and we're going to fight against that. Um, and, and, and before I go, earlier today, we had, we had a rally um, with, with members of labor, and it made me think about all the thousands of New Yorkers who may not be in a union but are under the same attack, the attack on their pocket by an industry that has chosen healthcare as the way to make money. And it made me be thankful for colleagues like you who are fighting for, for these New Yorkers to make sure that after the year we've had, I think now we know what we've always suspected and that healthcare is a profitable business that at the, um, that at the expense of many of our family members, they are uh, creating quite the racket to make money and this has to stop. I don't wanna be here three years from now asking the same questions. I don't wanna hear excuses from many of these hospitals. I wanna hear solutions and answers. And I hope that uh, my colleagues at the local level will be able to support uh, the bill that my colleague, Senator Gennardis and I are pushing to create that transparency, to force the hands of the hospitals and to put the power back on patients and on consumers. And with that, I'm gonna leave you and I thank you for the opportunity to be with you today. And let's put people first, let's put patients first over money. Thank you so much, assembly member. Um, I wanna make sure that the chairs don't have any questions before moving on. Okay, seeing none, um, thank you so much. So we will move on to our next panel, which will include David Rich followed by Leslie Moran. So David, you may begin when ready and once the Sergeant cues you. Yes, thank you, can you hear me? Hear me yes, okay? we can hear you. Uh, yes. Uh, hi, David Rich with the Greater New York Hospital Association. As you know, we represent all of the hospitals in the city and across the state, as well as in uh, neighboring states as well. I just have to say something I just heard saying hospitals allegedly save lives. In the last 18 months, the hospitals in New York City saved New Yorkers from the COVID-19 epidemic, pandemic. They worked 24 seven, no other institutions did that. Their staff from administrators to 1199 workers to NISNA workers sacrificed extremely hard, made sacrifices barely anybody else in the city made to save people from COVID-19. And for someone to in this hearing, I'm sorry to be so upset about this, to say hospitals allegedly save lives, they save lives every day. And this pandemic's not over. 
And unfortunately, while the pandemic continues, there are going to be a number of people following me testifying here today who have held rallies to bash those hospitals during a pandemic. And I'm sorry, I, I feel like that's not the way we deal with each other in a community like New York City. They have saved thousands and hundreds of thousands of lives. At a great cost, emotional cost, sacrifice, financial cost, the idea they're making money, hospitals are barely breaking even because of all of the high costs during the pandemic. While for-profit insurance companies who supposedly, according to the last speaker, are working with hospitals and trying, are making billions and billions of dollars. So I'm sorry, I just can't let this allegedly save lives when they're saving lives, even as we speak, go. Now to the topic at hand, um, we've testified on this a few times before, but I think we need to recognize that Placing all the blame for healthcare costs on hospitals is extremely myopic. Hospitals have the same cost pressures that all the other people in the healthcare community have. Who purchases more high cost pharmaceuticals than hospitals do? They suffer from the cost of the high cost of pharmaceuticals. They purchase more pharmaceuticals than any other entities in the city, in the state, in the country. And those are very high costs. Some of those pharmaceuticals they purchase, only hospitals purchase in order to save people's lives. And manufacturers have a monopoly on some of those. So they're very high costs. They have high costs of medical devices, machinery, you walk into an ER, all of those things are extremely expensive. They have all of these costs. They have very high health insurance costs. They use the revenues that they make to pay for health insurance with no co-pays and no deductibles for their thousands and thousands of union employees as well as non-union employees. Um, so they have very high cost of health insurance. And meanwhile, the insurance companies like United Healthcare, despite the high cost of healthcare, made profits of $22.4 billion last year and 12 billion this year. Empire, which is a part of Anthem, their profits were 6.2 billion in the year of the pandemic in 2020. Where is that money coming from? If it's not going to the high cost of healthcare, it's not going to pay for their enrollees. So the idea that it's hospitals, hospitals have costs. They have huge costs, like everybody else does. Pharmaceuticals and New Yorkers don't blame hospitals for the high cost of healthcare. We did a poll in July, along with 1199, our partners, uh, that found that 63% 63, uh, 63 of New Yorkers blamed pharmaceutical companies and 60% blamed insurance companies. They don't blame the hospitals. Hospitals have the same high cost inputs that everybody else does. They don't just, they don't spend nothing and then just come up with prices to charge people. They have to cover costs through Medicare payments, Medicaid payments, both of which grossly underpay for the cost of care. And so if they can, they need to try and shift some of those huge losses from Medicaid to the private sector, if they can. And a lot of our safety net hospitals can't do that, which as you know, they're on the ropes. They need to be bailed out by the state on a regular basis. So the idea that hospitals are in a vacuum and are not subject to all of the other high costs that everyone else in the healthcare system is subject to is just really wrong. And I, I feel like having, you know, we've had three hearings now focusing on hospital costs. And we've yet to have one on how it is that these for-profit insurers can make these huge profits, which hospitals are not making, and yet complain about the high cost of healthcare. Somehow they're making these huge profits. They're taking them out of the healthcare system. They're doing it by not paying hospitals and doctors. There was a USA Today article that I mentioned in my written testimony just last week, talking about how they owe billions and billions of, of dollars to hospitals and to doctors because the way they make money is by not paying. So anyway, I'm sorry to get this emotional, but our community is very emotional. The workers in our community are very emotional. They have been through a year and a half of saving people from this pandemic. And I just feel like using words like hospitals allegedly save lives is really out of bounds. Again, I'm sorry to get so emotional, but it's an emotional time for our community. And I'm happy to take whatever questions you might have. 
Thank you for your testimony. Um, we will turn to Leslie Moran. And I, before we do that, I just want to acknowledge that we were joined by council members Reynoso and Feliz. Um, and so Leslie Moran, you may begin your testimony once you are ready and the Sergeant cues you. Good morning. Are we good to go here? Okay, thank you. Good morning, uh, Chairperson Rivera, Chairperson Levine and members of the committee. My name is Leslie Moran. I'm Senior Vice President of the New York Health Plan Association. We are a not-for-profit organization that represents 28 health plans across the state and those plans provide coverage to more than 8 million fully insured New Yorkers. On behalf of our member health plans, I wanna thank you for the opportunity to address the committees on this important issue, um, looking at hospital costs and the impact that they have on access to care. Our member health plans are committed to the goal of universal coverage, and they have a long history of working collaboratively with New York government on efforts to expand access to high quality, affordable health care. Keeping health care affordable is a major challenge facing many employers and consumers, as has been noted by our chairs. This is especially true now, as so many are also struggling with the financial impact of the pandemic. Um, You've referenced it, the chairs have referenced it, and I do not need to tell you about the high cost of health care. Um, and I also don't need to, I'm sure I don't need to tell you that New York has some of the highest health care costs in the country, or that New York's costs are significantly higher than the national average. When people talk about health, the cost of health care, their reference is usually the cost of their health insurance. That's been acknowledged. The fact is that health insurance premiums and healthcare costs are inextricably linked. The growth in the cost of medical care that's charged by hospitals and other providers, increases in the prices of prescription drugs, and even government taxes and assessments on health insurance results in increases in health insurance premiums. By law, and this goes to, a, um, I guess, a comment from Mr. Rich, by law, health plans in New York must spend a minimum of 82 cents of every premium dollar on health care. That is a requirement. 82 cents must be spent on direct health care. Of that, an average of 42 cents is spent on hospital costs, inpatient, outpatient, and emergency services. So our comments today, we're looking at the, the, um, <coughs> the rising cost of hospital costs um, provider costs, especially the issues that are related to the increasing um, provider consolidation and contracting practices and the impact that that has on those costs. I'm sure everyone is familiar with the 2009 report from the New York State Health Foundation and the Health Cost, Healthcare Cost Institute that put a spotlight on New York's higher health care spending. A key finding of that report was that the spending was driven by ever rising prices not by increased utilization. And one area that was highlighted for particularly high growth in prices was hospitals. Again, both inpatient and outpatient services. Underscoring those findings, there's a growing body of research, a number of which we cite in our testimony, that demonstrates a primary driver of increased provider prices is consolidation of healthcare providers into health systems, which increases their market power. Another similarity of the studies was the conclusion that merger activities had no statistically significant impact on quality. So what can we do? We believe that government can play an important role to improve the current market dynamics, taking steps to promote greater accountability of provider transaction, provide increased transparency of provider costs, and restrict contracting practices that harm consumers and employers. Um, our written testimony outlined some of the potential approaches and very briefly, I would highlight three that we talk about. The first, eliminate anti-competitive con contracting prices or practices. This includes prohibiting all or nothing clauses that require um, insurers to contract with all facilities within a network, even if there is not a, a reason for them to necessarily have every single um, one of those facilities in their, uh, their network promoting quality improvements through contracting that's based on quality measures. There's been a, a movement towards value-based payment uh, arrangements. Those are uh, not as fruitful as, as we all might hope. 
um, barring confidentiality clauses that limit consumers' access to information about the prices that are charged, and allowing consumers to use benefit design to encourage them to obtain care at more affordable provider sites. Uh, a second uh, um, suggestion is enhancing the oversight of provider mergers. Um, requiring annual reporting of provider entities that merge and asking them or making them hold their prices flat for a three to five year period. This would help ensure that the benefits that are ascribed to merger activities, such as promises of lower cost and improved quality, are actually realized. And third, uh, banning hospital facility fees. This would do away with the practice of hospitals imposing facility fees for services that are provided in a hospital or at a facility that is not on the hospital's campus. As I said earlier, the health plan industry is committed to efforts aimed at reining in the factors that drive increases in the cost of care in order to ensure that every New Yorker has access to high quality and affordable health care. We are committed to working with you and others in the pol other policymakers on measures that are directed at these goals. Again, I thank you very much for inviting us to be here today. We appreciate the opportunity to offer our views and our comments, and we're happy to engage in further discussions with the council. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. We will now turn to the chairs for questions. Chair Rivera. Thank you so much for being here today and for your testimony. So how do hospitals communicate with patients before they receive care about their potential costs? So they do it in a variety of ways. One of the um, requirements of the um, Trump administration rule from last year on price transparency was to either post the um, prices of 300 uh, shoppable services or provide a cost estimator. And what most of our members have done is provide cost estimators on their websites um, which was an option they could do in lieu of the um, 300 shoppable services. I just do want to say that I take exception to the idea that they have ignored the federal rule. It's an extremely complex rule. There are literally millions of codes of negotiated rates and items and services that hospitals provide. And it's an extremely hard thing for them to put together. The rule went into effect during the second wave of the pandemic. So there was a lot going on in the institutions at the time. They are trying as hard as they can to comply and I expect that they all will um, in very short order. So I just wanna, I understand you mentioned the, the, the federal regulation, but so, so can you just kind of answer that with a little bit more detail in terms of your communication with patients? Yes, so they have, so what they can um, point patients to before they actually receive a service, obviously if it's a scheduled service and not the many emergency services that hospitals provide day in and day out. But if it's a scheduled service, they can, they provided cost estimators so that they can help patients understand what the costs will be. Now, you do have to understand that when someone goes into a hospital for a scheduled, scheduled service, sometimes things happen, not everything goes right. It's why it's better to go to a hospital than to a freestanding ambulatory surger, surgery center for your care, because if something should come up during a surgery and they need more hospital care, then it will be obviously more services provided and it will be the same amount that was estimated before they um, had the procedure done. But that is how they help provide those costs and um, and make those costs available to, uh, to uh, their patients through these um, out-of-pocket cost estimators that were part of the, um, the Trump administration rule from last year. So what are the barriers to this communication? Well, there's not a barrier to that communication. What has been difficult is because of the many insurers that they deal with, the different insurance products, um, insurers negotiate different rates um, and reimbursement levels, even with when they have different insurance products. So Empire, for instance, has a Medicare insurance product, a Medicaid insurance product, private insurance products, HMOs, they have PPOs, and they may negotiate different rates for all of the different items and services. And then you have to multiply that by 
several different insurance companies. And so it has been a huge undertaking to try and make that all of that available. One part of the rule was that they have to um, make available their standard charges, but that's been a rule ever since the ACA um, was passed in 2010. And so they have done that for very many years. That's not all that helpful to consumers because most insurance companies negotiate downward from those standard charges. And because of financial assistance plans and other things that the hospitals provide, very few people pay those standard charges. But that, that they have posted for quite some time. Um, but they're trying to figure out ways to be as consumer friendly as possible. And those cost estimators, out-of-pocket cost estimators seem to be the thing that consumers can get their hands around and understand best in terms of what the cost may be. So I guess, can you speak to why a hospital, all right, so in New York State, do hospital procedures tend to be reimbursed by private insured, insurers utilizing a fee-for-service model, or can hospitals also receive a more aggregated form of payment? They can receive a more aggregated form of payment. Um, called bundled payments, for instance, for a specific type of service. So for instance, you may get an orthopedic service provided and then everything might be, all the ancillary services associated with the surgery might be part of you know, one bundled payment. Um, for the most part, hospitals and insurers still do um, negotiate uh, using DRGs, diagnostic related groups for inpatient services, and then a different type of, um, a different type of payment for outpatient services, but those usually are the diagnostic related, they usually still use diagnostic related groups, at least in the city, um, when they are negotiating with, um, with health plans. Uh, Ms. Moran, did you want to add anything to, to this? Mm -hmm. uh, I would just add that health plans also have um, cost estimators for for their consumers um, so that before someone has a procedure, they can go and look at um, what their out-of-pocket costs might be. They can also do some comparison shopping. They can also look at what uh, procedure might cost. And, and Fair Health, um, which I'm, I presume you're very familiar with Fair Health, which is a um, now national <coughs> uh, organization that, that um, helps consumers figure out what their costs are going to be and also do comparison shopping. So they can look and see what the costs might be at hospital A versus B versus C. Um, uh, on the downside, it may be that not all of those hospitals are in the network, or it may be that um, a consumer has a preference for going to one hospital over another. It kind of goes to the point that I made uh, in my remarks that you know, we, one thing we think would be beneficial is if health plans were allowed to um, communicate more with consumers about uh, the, the different facilities and, and maybe even steer them towards a facility that might have lower costs and higher quality. Um, but right now, some of the contracting practices in place don't allow us to necessarily direct patients based on those types of metrics. So consumers um, really have to look at what their costs are. Do estimator, do cost estimators include their deductible? It, generally speaking, my understanding is yes, a cost estimator, you would put in all the factors of your coverage and you would, um, you would see what your costs for a procedure were, and then you would have to know if you've met your deductible or, or apply that to your deductible. So can you all speak to why hospital costs vary so much for the same procedures? For example, why one hospital system charges $9,000 for a standard colonoscopy while the average of all the others is only $4,000? I cannot really speak to that. That's a, a question that we have as well. So how does- Yeah, I can't necessarily speak to that specific example. 
But, you know, what hospitals uh, have to do is negotiate with a variety of insurers. Um, some of the insurers, as I mentioned before, are national in scope. Um, they don't have a whole lot of, you know, power when they're negotiating with some of these larger insurers. Um, some hospitals may have a lot more um, enrollees from one insurer that use their hospital than another, in which case there might be a dynamic in negotiation um, where both the hot, where the insurer feels like uh, because their enrollees have shown a preference for that hospital where they may negotiate a higher rate than they might with another. Um, one problem that we do have, which I think was very inadequately discussed in the um, New York State Health Foundation report is that a lot of our safety net hospitals in the Bronx, in Brooklyn, in Queens, uh, don't have as much in terms of commercially insured patients. And so therefore they don't have the ability to negotiate um, very good rates with the um, private insurers because the private insurers feel like they can pay them whatever they want to pay them, frankly. And so they tend to have lower rates than hospitals who have a higher um, level of commercially insured um, patients because the insurance companies feel like they need to compensate them in, in order to take care of a large number of their employees. So, so that can vary. If you're a teaching hospital, you have much higher costs than you do if you're a non-teaching hospital um, for a whole variety of reasons, including that you take the most complex cases the community hospitals will transfer to you. So you have the high cost cases, you know, disproportionate number of the high cost cases as opposed to the low cost cases. Um, and, and also we really can't ignore the fact that Medicare and Medicaid so underpay hospitals that they feel the need, if they can, to uh, charge more to other payers um, if they can negotiate those larger payments because the Medicaid program in the state of New York covers 70% of the cost on average of the cost of a Medicaid patient being served by a hospital. So there are a whole variety of different reasons why there might be variations, um, but those are some, some of them that I can identify. So how do you all analyze, study, or gather metrics about cost discrepancies between systems? We don't. Um, we're not really allowed to know all the different prices because of um, antitrust requirements. So we really are not ones to analyze prices across different hospitals. Um, but perhaps um, Leslie could answer that question. We have the same um, antitrust protections in place for our members as well. So we, we cannot gather um, the negotiated uh, you know, costs that individual plans have with their with their hospitals that are in their network. So we don't have that type of um, analytical ability. So what more can hospitals do to ensure hospital accessibility and affordability for patients? Well, I think that there are a variety of things that they um, currently do. Um, and that they can continue to do. Number one, um, they do have um, robust financial assistance policies, so many of which go beyond the state requirements for financial assistance. Um, they also are, as I mentioned, providing the cost estimators so people can understand the costs. Mm -hmm. They, unlike any other provider, not physician groups, not freestanding amp surge, not anyone else, take everybody who comes to their doors so obviously they are the most accessible providers that there are out there. Um, and so, you know, I think that, you know, the idea that they are completely unaccessible to, um, to New Yorkers, I think is, is not the case. But I think, you know, look, they, there are lots of things that they are trying to do to become as accessible as possible. Thank goodness New York now has a relatively low uninsured rate. Um, what they also try to do when people are on, come in and are admitted to the hospital is they immediately try to um, sign them up for whatever public health insurance they're available is available to them and they're eligible for. So they sign them up right away for Medicaid. If they're an undocumented person, they sign them up for emergency Medicaid. Um, they'll sign them up for the essential plan to the extent they can. 
um, in a whole variety of different ways. And we've always strongly supported, along with our partners, 1199 SEIU, all of the different public health insurance options that New York has taken and hopefully will continue to take um, in the future to make sure that healthcare is as, as accessible as possible to all New Yorkers. And, and you mentioned the, the federal rule and you know, starting January 1st of this year, the federal hospital price transparency rule required hospitals to display files on their websites containing gross charges, uh, pair specific negotiated chargers, discounted cash prices, and de-identified minimum and maximum negotiated charges. And so what percentage of your members are complying with this rule? And for those that are not complying, what is the reason? So I did mention this before, um, I don't have a percentage, but all of them are complying with the standard, you know, the standard charges requirement, which as I mentioned has been in effect uh, for a while because the ACA required that. Um, they are um, all, all either um, complying with the 300 shoppable services or the cost estimator, which there was a choice in the rule to have the cost out-of-pocket cost estimator that I mentioned before, or uh, list the 300 shoppable um, services that um, and their negotiated rates. What they have been struggling with, very frankly, is the, um, the requirement that they put every single item in service and the negotiated rate with every single insurance company um, on their website. That has been difficult to comply with. We have um, a number of hospital systems that have, but we have others who are still struggling with that. And frankly, where are safety net hospitals are going to have the, the people power to actually comply with that kind of requirement when they are working as hard as they can just to keep their lights on is really an issue. I think they need some help. They need resources. We all know they need resources, but it is gonna be very difficult for them to come into compliance with um, that kind of a rule that will require them to take people away from other um, duties in order to go ahead and um, comply with that rule. Well, as I mentioned in my opening statement, H&H &H is compliant, uh, friendly reminder. So what, what can the city do to ensure better compliance from others with, with this rule? And how has this rule helped patients receive better care? You know, I don't know. It depends on whether this rule really helps patients understand what they're looking at. I think having lists and lists and lists and lists and lists and lists, and lists of negotiated rates for each item and service is going to be extremely overwhelming for a consumer, which is part of why the option was given um, for 300 shoppable services under the rule or the out-of-pocket cost estimator. So I think um, we will see if, if um, consumers find the cost estimators to be helpful to them. As Leslie mentioned, insurers have those as well. Um, it really is the insurers who have a better sense of who is still enrolled in their insurance plan, what their deductibles are, how much of their deductible they've met. It's very difficult for a hospital to know that in September that a person might have either used none of their deductible yet or all of it yet. Um, so in, in many ways, I think the insurer really has much more of the information that um, a consumer might need than a hospital might. Um, but it has been very difficult to comply with that one piece of it, which is um, every single negotiated rate for the thousands and thousands of items and services that hospitals provide. So let me ask you, Ms. Miranda, how, how do insurers and other stakeholders determine the cost of the procedures they cover? For the most part, they are negotiated um, with, with the hospitals. Um, and yeah, it, it's, you know, it's, a, it's an, a regular or an, a renegotiation process on a regular basis, but they are based also, as, as David pointed out, there are some kind of guidelines, some of uh, the diagnostic related groups. So you, you know what is kind of usual and customary, if you will. Um, but you know, to, to David's point about 
the overwhelming amount of information for consumers. Um, you know, everybody gets their insurance policy and it's, you know, a hundred pages long and most everybody sticks it in a drawer someplace thinking I'll read it if I need to, to see what's in there. Um, but some information is included in that, but what consumers really want is easy to understand, digestible information. They want, and they mostly want to know how much is this going to cost me? Um, and that's where the consumer cost estimators come into play. It's where um, health plans, customer service departments come into play because a consumer can always reach out and talk to someone at the plan and have someone help them walk through what the procedure is, what their deductible is, what the cost might be um, at different facilities. Again, where we can't help a consumer is by saying to them, hospital A has you know, better quality rating or hospital B has you know, the same quality rating, but uh, a lower um, charges a lower price for that procedure. So that's, you know, that we think that's some place where um, we could use help from policymakers in order to make it easier for consumers to get that type of information on um, quality and value at, at the different facilities that they might be considering. All right, so I, my last, I'll ask one more question and, and turn it over um, to my co-chair. I guess Ms. Moran, <laughs> 2019, as I mentioned, more than 10% of adults have reported uh, that that uh, they delayed or did not get care because of costs. What what is being done to address this? Um, that's a, a very good question. Um, we work hard with patients and and consumers to try and make sure that they understand what what their coverage is. Um, but again, as I said, for many, many people, it's what is it going to cost me? And, and it's a conscious decision to um, take a, a policy that might have a higher deductible because the premium remains low. And you have someone who thinks, I, you know, I'm never going to meet that deductible because I'm healthy and, I, and nothing's, you know, I don't have any serious healthcare needs and I just want to make sure I have coverage. And then they turn around and something happens and they're saddled with, um, they get sick, they get COVID um, or anything else. And they suddenly need to go to the doctor, but they're worried about meeting that deductible. Um, you can't unwind and go back and change the decision that was made at the front end to take that health plan. The only thing we can do is try and better educate consumers about the the um, value of the products that they are buying and make them you know, consider all the various scenarios that might come into play um, so that they're aware of it. But ultimately it's a consumer decision. Well, um, I, I appreciate it. I, I, I thank you for being here. I know that we'll certainly, we'll hear from my co-chair now and there are people here to give their perspective and their story. So I do hope you'll you'll stay the duration of the hearing to listen. Certainly. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to my co-chair, uh, Mark Levine for, for his question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chair Rivera. And uh, we appreciate both of you, Mr. Rich and Ms. Moran for being here. Just wanna start by, by speaking for myself and I think everyone who's testifying today, uh, th there is no doubt at the, the depth of, of my admiration for healthcare workers, uh, something I, and I think everyone else here speaking today has expressed uh, quite passionately uh, over the last year and a half and, and before. There's no contradiction between um, uplifting our healthcare workers and their heroic efforts during the pandemic and wanting fair and transparent pricing in hospitals, um, which also uh, is a matter uh, of great interest to workers, other essential workers. And in fact, uh, I think fair, transparent pricing ultimately, ultimately would be a win-win. It would probably be good for the hospital sector as well. Um, uh, but get, getting on to questions, um, 
Mr. Rich, you, you um, laid a lot of blame on pharmaceutical companies, medical device manufacturers, insurance companies. Uh, I'm not here to defend any of those players, believe me. But we have a situation where two hospitals who are buying the same pharmaceuticals and the same medical devices are charging uh, totally different prices for exactly the same procedures, the same MRI of a lower limb or the same colonoscopy, uh, the same bariatric surgery. Uh, prices can vary by thousands of dollars. Uh, and they're facing the same constraints, the, all the constraints that you describe. And I'm not talking about a hospital in New York City versus a hospital in North Dakota. I'm talking about two hospitals that can be in the same borough, both in Manhattan. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm also not even comparing uh, uh, an academic medical center to a public hospital. Uh, I mean, this is the ultimate apple to apple comparison. You can look at two academic medical uh, centers uh, providing services both in the borough of Manhattan, sometimes very close to each other. And the prices can be quite different. And I, I've, I've tried to study this issue. I can't wrap my mind around how that's possible. So perhaps you can explain the differential in pricing where the only variable is which hospital system the patient's going to. Sure, and I'm, I'm glad you asked this question because it gives me an opportunity to, um, to make a point that I think will be um, made in a confused manner later. We have one of the most competitive, if not the most competitive hospital system in the country. We have six major hospital systems competing with each other. Um, H and H, we have Montefiore, we have Mount Sinai, we have NYU, we have Northwell, and we have NYP. So the idea that there is one dominant healthcare system that is able to just sort of, you know, you know, be a monopoly is absolutely not the case. We also have smaller hospital systems. We also have a whole variety of independent hospitals. So, so this, the, the, uh, the accusation that is sometimes made that we have hospitals with so much market share that don't have competition um, and can do whatever they want is just not the case here in New York City. Um, they have major um, competitors. And if prices vary, they probably vary for a whole lot of different reasons. These are also prices I should point out. And as, you know, as Leslie mentioned, um, they're negotiated rates with insurance companies who, by the way, are consolidating more and more um, between United Healthcare and Aetna and, um, and Empire, which is Anthem at the national level. So, you know, I can't totally give you all the reasons why there may be a hospital system that has higher prices for one insurer, lower for others, um, because those are all subject to the vagaries of negotiations between two parties. Um, but I do know that we have an extremely competitive hospital system. The places where they've talked about mergers increasing prices are really places where there's one hospital system for the whole area, or maybe two. And there's very little, you know, there's very little the insurers can do about lowering prices. That's not true here in, the, in New York City. Um, people have a lot of choice and there are a lot of different hospitals that they can go to. Um, and so anyway, uh, that's, that's my answer, such as it is right now. Uh, thank you. I want to acknowledge just uh, for a moment that we've been joined by two of our colleagues, uh, Councilmember and Dr. Matthew Eugene and Councilmember Ampri Samuel. Um, and you said that there are six, uh, you pointed out that there are six um, major hospital systems in the city, but uh, boy, that number is way down. Uh, we have seen a pretty remarkable wave of consolidations and mergers and, and, and even some closures over the past uh, decade or so. Uh, I mean, dozens, uh, dozens of, of these types of, of transactions. And one of the basic rules of the marketplace is when you have fewer uh, entities competing, 
uh, it gives them the chance to raise prices. Uh, why, why doesn't that, that rule apply here when the number of hospitals competing in the marketplace has gone down from scores to now uh, only six? Well, it's not only six because there are independent hospitals and there's also you know, uh, Sloan Kettering, Hospitals for Special Surgery, but also a lot of independent hospitals in the city. But, you know, they're negotiating. They, they all want, you know, as much market share as they can get, and people can vote with their feet. People can decide they'll go to one hospital system rather than another. And the more transparent these prices become, the more people will be able to do that. And the more that, I, you know, again, I think it's the insurance companies that are the best equipped to provide these cost estimators because they know what, how much of a deductible someone's used or what part of it, you know, if they have an HSA or an HMO, um, I think over time, but there, this, is a, this is an incredibly, um, an incredibly dynamic and competitive marketplace. I should also say that the state has encouraged large systems to take on smaller hospitals that are having difficulty surviving on their own. Um, we've seen that in hospital systems um, helping out and taking and downright taking over hospitals in Brooklyn, in Queens, in the Bronx, in Southern Westchester, Montefiore with Mount Vernon and, and uh, New Rochelle Hospital and some others. So that's been, that's been a policy of the state to try and help these smaller hospitals that are more financially challenged become, become part of a larger system so they can benefit from some of the um, scaling opportunities that they have being part of a larger system. By, by definition, with pricing uh, this inconsistent, there are some sort of breakdown in the normal kind of competition that uh, would generally flatten prices in a marketplace. Uh, and I I cited uh, a, a few uh, procedures earlier uh, that, that are, are, are a few where uh, researchers have determined uh, wildly divergent, divergent pricings. Um, just how much variation is there? Uh, how much variation is there in the cost of a colostom uh, colonoscopy uh, uh, between the highest and lowest priced providers in New York City? That I do not know because we are, again, we're not allowed to collect pricing information because of antitrust issues amongst our members. Um, it's possible that Leslie representing the payers would have a better sense of that, but I, that information I do not have. Well, just based on what advocates have been able to piece together from public sources, uh, it's clear that those prices vary a lot that uh, sometimes it can be, it can cost more than double uh, in some extreme cases, even uh, a higher markup than that. And, and these are very expensive, expensive procedures. So you're talking about thousands of dollars potentially um, for exactly the same procedure. And I just want to re reiterate, it's such a key point. These are hospitals which are buying from the same drug companies, the same medical device companies that are working in the same, uh, uh, employment environment, uh, and so uh, it, it just it, it it boggles the mind that there can be such variation in price uh, to that degree. Uh, I, I I do want to talk about the federal uh, hospital transparency rules, which you you have been very careful uh, to uh, continually describe as Trump administration rules. Uh, uh, of course, knowing that he's not a popular guy around here. I, I want to clarify that um, this kind of federal uh, requirement for hospital trans price transparency has been long sought after by patient advocates for years. And uh, somewhat weirdly, the Trump administration latched on to this. Uh, maybe it's because Donald Trump doesn't like paying bills. I don't know. And like most of what Donald Trump touched, let me rephrase that, like everything that Donald Trump touches. Uh, he made something of a mess of, of this. I certainly acknowledge that. But needless to say, there's additional information which now um, about pricing, which now uh, are, uh, the law requires um, uh, come out in a transparent way. And that does at least 
offer some new tools for consumers and advocates to understand the scale of the problem that we're describing that you just conceded um, it's difficult to get a grip on because of uh, the opaque nature of, of, of this uh, industry. Um, and uh, it, is, it is currently the law that all hospitals are required to comply with. Um, forgive me if you said this earlier, um, Chair Rivera may have asked this, but what percent of your members have now uh, complied with making uh, the required pricing trans transparency public? I do not know the percentage, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I know that some have, I know that some have not. Um, and it also depends on which parts of the regulation um, are at issue. The standard charges, um, they have all had on their websites for a number of years because that was not a new requirement, uh, although it was repeated in the, in the, um, in the new rules. Um, the, the, they are all providing cost estimators, which was allowed in lieu of the 300 shoppable charges um, or negotiated rates um, that, were, um, that were provided for in the rule. But again, the, the piece they've had the most difficult time from a um, burdensome uh, man and woman power perspective is the listing out of just thousands and thousands of items and services with different negotiated rates within different insurance companies, different um, products that are uh, negotiated by insurance companies. Insurance companies have Medicare products, Medicaid products, um, HMOs, PPOs, other types of products, all of which often have different negotiated rates associated with them. And then that, multiply that by a whole number of insurers and thousands and thousands and thousands of items and services that need to be listed. Um, again, I question the utility of that for a specific consumer because it will be listed on a website in spreadsheets that are will go necessarily go on and on and on and on and on. Um, but I think the cost estimators, which is what the hospitals have really focused on, because we think those are probably the most consumer friendly piece of this and the consumer understandable piece of this, as well as what the insurers are doing in terms of their cost estimators will really be the things that are going to be most helpful for consumers. If I would add, go ahead, Leslie, please. Um, I was just going to come in behind David with, uh, I think he has highlighted some of the difficulty, um, you know, of consumers getting some information. I mean, it, not to invoke the former president's name again, but the one thing I would say we could all agree with is was his statement about who knew that healthcare was so complicated. So, you know, consumers don't shop for healthcare the same way that they shop for other things. I mean, consumers have long used consumer reports to when they're buying a, a washing machine and, or something like that. Um, I use the example oftentimes of, you know, I have, I have two dogs. When I go to the vet, um, I do get an estimate of what the procedures, what the charters are gonna be based on what procedures are going to be provided. So, you know, I have an estimate and we can discuss that before we go forward with it. Consumers don't shop for their healthcare in that way, um, in part because healthcare is a much more, um, if you will, emotional purchase. Um, you, you actually hope you're not going to be using healthcare, catastrophic healthcare um, much, but you wanna make sure that it's there. Um, but it's also, you know, people don't pick their doctors, they pick their doctors not based on what their charges are going to be, but by whom their neighbors have recommended or who they have a relationship with. So it's a very personal um, service, if you will. So, and, and I think it can be overwhelming to consumers to get an overload of information. On the flip side, I would point to some of the progress that we've made. I mean, if you look at um, the New York State of Health, you are able to go into the New York State of Health the, the marketplace and plug in your parameters for what you want and you, up will pop a number of choices of health plans for you to choose from 
and you'll get the very basics on what your premium would be, what your deductible would be. Um, you can then drill down and find out what the networks are of, you can make sure that a doctor you want to see is within that provider network, a hospital in your community is in the, in the provider network. So there are there's more information as you drill down, but many consumers <coughs> get overwhelmed as they go down page after page after page of this information. So I would just argue that there are ways we can try and simplify it and make it easier for, for consumers. But at the same time, you wanna make sure they have access to that wealth of, of information that truly is necessary for them to make the best decisions, best and most informed decisions for what's best for their healthcare needs. It's, yes, look, it's true that if I have a medical emergency of some sort, I'm not going to pause and, and uh, navigate to a federal website to review pricing. You're going to go but, and get it taken care of. <laughs> of course, but all the more reason to ensure we have fair pricing in those circumstances because the patient isn't going to be able to, to shop around and that uh, without constraints, that and, can be exploited. Right, and, and that's why that's why we've taken steps in New York um, through, you know, landmark legislation in New York to protect consumers from um, surprise medical bills, surprise billing. But, and, but and, even but but even uh, in cases where it's not an emergency, where it's a scheduled procedure, uh, and so I have time to uh, think about where I want it done. Uh, it's it is. You, you need a master's in, in uh, economics, at least, to, to figure this out. Uh, and it's it, it just no easy way, even if you have time to sit and review where you want to get the procedure done, to easily compare prices. And, you know, the, the truth is that the, the federal transparency rules... Um, really uh, are not perfect. And uh, I think advocates have made that point um, uh, quite, quite uh, openly. But you know, the, the hospitals could, could solve this on their own. They could do better. Uh, they could take the federal rules as a baseline and create really clear, transparent, consumer-friendly apples to apples communication on this. And the fact that that hasn't happened uh, uh, make, makes me wonder how committed uh, the hospitals are to solving this problem. Uh, what, 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 what do you say on that, uh, Mr. Rich? I think they have. As I mentioned, they have put into effect the cost estimator option that was a part of the rule. They made a priority of doing that because that is the, the, the one piece we think of the rule that is going to be most helpful to consumers. They want to you know, go to a cost estimator, figure out what their out-of-pocket costs would be. I mean, it also, I mean, one thing that I think Leslie was getting at too is, I know when I have a procedure and you know, I rely on my doctor to refer me to a surgeon who uses a specific hospital, um, and that's pretty much how I make my decisions because I trust my doctor and, I tr you know, and, and where he or she is going to uh, send me. So, you know, the, the shopping around doesn't happen quite as much as people might think it would because of that dynamic. But again, they are committed to this. They've done the cost estimators. Again, I think they've made a priority of what they thought consumers would find the most helpful as opposed to the... <laughs> Excel spreadsheet that goes on for thousands and thousands of pages. And so I think, uh, I think they're very committed to it and they've done that. And by the way, um, the speaker before us said the $300 million fine, those fines have now been up to, um, up to $2 million depending on the size of the institution. So the idea they're just ignoring this, they never ignore laws or regulations. They are trying really hard to comply with what is an extremely complicated rule. Um, I did want to ask a couple of questions uh, to Ms. Moran. Um, uh, Ms. Mr. Rich had stated, uh, and it's been widely reported, that uh, the pandemic has been very profitable for 
the insurance industry, particularly for large insurance providers, uh, which which are covering the great majority of New Yorkers. Uh, how can you explain uh, what what Mr. Rich called multi billion dollar profits um, in the face of of what appears to be uh, what clearly is overcharging uh, of patients? Well, um, first of all, I would go back to my comment that in New York and even and nationally, there are requirements set in statute for what percentage, what how much of each um, health insurance premium dollar must go to pay for medical care. In New York state, it's 82 cents of every dollar or 85 cents if in the small group market. Um, nationally, it's 85 cents of every dollar. <coughs> So those quote profits that that you're talking about, some insurers making are largely from investments and dividends and things like that. They're not coming out of the premium dollar. That premium dollar has to be dedicated to um, health care. Um, and when you look at the actual profit margins or the rate of return for health insurers nationally. Um, and those in New York State, uh, you know, those making a, a profit margin of 4% is rare. So they're on par with many hospitals and what hospitals are making. And, and many of our plans are making, uh, have a return of less than that. Um, so I, I think talking about the two things uh, together is, is not accurate because the premium dollar goes to, to healthcare, profits come from other investments and other um, things within the insurance model. I would say that during the pandemic, um, health plans were not making a lot of money. They were actually, uh, health plans were asked and responded um, to providing healthcare services for COVID treatments, for testing, for vaccines, all without any cost sharing. Many of those uh, emergency regulations are still in place. So plans were paying for those costs without anything coming out of the consumer's pocket, which we agreed was the right thing to do. In addition to that, health plans also um, extended grace periods. So for individuals who couldn't pay their premium or for businesses that couldn't pay their premium, they had extended grace periods so they could maintain their coverage. And in fact, the New York State of Health has put out reports that show that in New York, people didn't lose their coverage during the pandemic, largely because of the efforts of health plans working in cooperation with the state to make sure the coverage stayed intact and that people could get access. We felt it was vitally important that people have uninterrupted access to care during the pandemic, and that's ongoing. Um, and then lastly, I would point out that those costs that plans have absorbed in terms of delayed premium payments, in terms of paying for um, hospital and, and doctor services and vaccines and um, testing and treatment for COVID, um, those are costs that the plans have to absorb and will be seen probably in losses that we will start realizing this year and next year. So we haven't really seen the impact of the COVID um, pandemic on health plans. There have been some national estimates that say that the impact on health plans, what they've absorbed will be in the $60, $60 billion range or higher. Those are costs that plans have absorbed that we're gonna see the impact of down the road. Well, the the... <laughs> The, trans the level of transparency on this calculation of 82% of premiums going to healthcare might even be lower than the level of transparency on hospital pricing. We could probably do a whole hearing on that. Um, well, um, uh, but actually, they have plans have to, health plans are the only part of the health. Um, I, I, just, just let me finish my point because we, we have a lot of people waiting, waiting to speak. The, the truth is that you know, I've I've heard the analogy that if someone tells you you can only eat 82% of a bowl of ice cream, you're just going to ask for a bigger bowl. So the, the, the prices just continue to go up. 
But but on the topic of, of profits, I, I just did want to ask Mr. Rich, hospitals in New York State are, are nonprofits, but still the term profit is often used in that context. And there was a report in Axios that identified a 12% profit margin at Northwell. Uh, and so how, you know, how, how should the public be comfortable with that when the cost for some procedures from commercial insurance is triple what it is for Medicaid uh, at that hospital network? Well, I'm not familiar with that statistic. I know that we did a survey of our members, including Northwell, um, just recently to figure out where their financials are post-pandemic. Um, overall, the hospitals uh, had negative 3% margins in 2020, um, even with the federal assistance that came in, which by the way, many of our hospitals would not have survived without that federal assistance. Um, so uh, that doesn't foot with the statistic that you just gave. And also um, in the first six months of this year, um, overall, our hospitals made about a 0.5% margin, barely breaking even. Um, so I, I can't speak to the, ax the statistic you got from Axios, but that is not foot at all with our understanding of where our hospital financials are at this point. I mean, the, the amount they had to spend last year and continue to spend because the pandemic's not over yet, even though everyone wants to act like it is and the hospitals are no longer dealing with it. But, you know, they still have extremely high costs and they are still struggling financially because of the pandemic. Um, uh, if, if you follow me on Twitter, Mr. Rich, you know I'm not acting like the pandemic's over. Uh, yes, I know. and, uh, I, I know you're not feeling it in the hospitals. Uh, I, I do just, uh, because we have a number of our colleagues who want to, um, ask questions. I uh, just had one final question for, for Ms. Moran. Um, I don't think the public understands that, um, many people, uh, get their health insurance through a self-insured plan, often through a labor union. And I wonder if you could explain how that's different and what portion of, of um, the public is actually getting their insurance from, from self-insured plans? Certainly. So self-insured, um, fully insured means that, that the health plan oversees the um, payment of claims as well as delivery of the healthcare services through its network of providers. Self-insured means a usually large employer um, does all the, the, they control the money part of the, uh, the healthcare, you know, what they're going to spend on healthcare. They, they develop a budget that annually for what they will spend on healthcare. Um, and then they will work with a health plan and use the health plans network and, and very often use the, the health plan to process its claims. But some of the self-insured plans actually do their claims processing themselves if they're large enough. Um, self-insured plans are exempt from state laws, so they can design their own benefit plans and, and do their own negotiation on premiums and, and negotiations with hospital costs, et cetera, as 32BJ, the 32BJ fund does and other um, public em employers do. Um, and to answer your question about the percentage of New Yorkers that are self-insured. Uh, I believe the statistics when we last looked at them was it's about 53% of every person who has health insurance in New York state is in a self-insured plan. So they are in a program that is not covered by state or city regulations. Right, and it just, it emphasizes the point that um, these pricing problems directly impact workers who ultimately are, are bearing the cost um, because uh, they have to put their negotiating capital uh, into uh, bearing higher and higher hospital costs as opposed to wages for workers who very much need it. So um, uh, I, I do want to pass it on to our colleagues. So I, I thank you both, uh, Mr. Rich and Ms. Moran, um, and I will pass it back I guess to M to, uh, to cue us for our, our next speaker. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, chairs. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to council members, other council members for their questions. 
As a reminder, if council members have questions for a panelist, you should use the raise hand function in Zoom at this time. So um, I will first call on council member Eugene, followed by council member Holden. Time starts now. So um, council member Eugene um, may be having some technical difficulties. So instead I will turn it to council member Holden if council member Holden is ready. Time starts now. Thank you both. Uh, thank you all. Thank you chairs. And thank you for uh, both for the great testimony. Um, and I just want to uh, touch upon David Rich's comments uh, early, you know, in the, uh, in the testimony. Um, by the way, Mr. Rich, I agree with you. The Assemblywoman's unfortunate comment that hospitals allegedly save lives was hurtful and disrespectful to the thousands of dedicated men and women who serve every day and night in our hospitals with so many stressful situations. They do save lives. There's no doubt about that. So I agree with you, David. Um, and, I, and I understand your passion on that. So that comment was out of line. Um, um, I think we all understand that dealing with insurance companies can be frustrating and puzzling for everyone. I mean, even for hospitals and, and certainly for patients. Um, and I think we can all agree an overhaul of the process needs to be examined. And I think we've been trying that for a long time. But let me ask about the hospital's internal operations regarding trying to cut costs without compromising quali the quality of the healthcare. Uh, for instance, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, I had a recent hospital stay well, along with my mom. My mom was 97. She had a hospital stay. And I noticed something that was very curious in both stays that I didn't notice when I, I was in a hospital very, very long ago, years ago, like let's say 20 years ago. I, we didn't get, we, I kind of felt there was a duplication of services, uh, Mr. Rich, you know, um, that appeared to me that the, either the hospital or the doctors that were coming were trying to pad the bill because they would ask, I would get house, you know, doctors coming in every few hours asking the same questions that I had just answered. And it was like, there was, there seemed to be no point um, in the visit that, cause they were asking the same questions, doing the same things and coming up with the same, solu you know, solutions. So it was like four different doctors on within like, let's say a three or four hour period and then they were, they, obviously they were charging for their visit. So it seemed to me that maybe that's a little bit, uh, you know, a padding. Is that, is, does the hospitals, do the hospitals really, because uh, I mentioned this, my son works at a hospital and I mentioned this to him and I said, uh, he goes, oh yeah, we need to examine our procedures. Um, and I just thought that, um, that should be a focus where we could try to say, without compromising healthcare, we could try to see where there's a duplication, where there's waste. Does, does, do the hospitals do that? Yes, and first of all, thank you so much for your comments, um, Council Member Levine. I really appreciate them. Um, they do, and I, you know, I can't speak to exactly what happened um, in your case. Um, there are different situations where there may be some duplication, for instance, in teaching hospitals, for instance, there may be situations where um, an attending physician is attending, but then a resident will also come and check in on a patient and um, check in on how it's going. Um, there may be different specialists that are part of the case that might have slightly different reasons for checking in on a patient. Um, you know, again, I can't speak to your exact, um, your exact situation. And I would hope that they were not just totally duplicative um, visits. And I, I know that the hospitals certainly do everything they can to try and make sure there's not duplication. It's not in their interest for someone to be in the hospital longer than they need to be, partly because as I mentioned before, they, they're paid sort of one amount, which is that DRG I was talking about before, no matter how long the patient stays. So uh, duplication is not something that certainly um, helps the hospital financially, um, you know, and I would hope that it wouldn't be physicians just charging again for something someone else did before, but certainly efficiency, especially given um, 
the, the difficulty with low Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement rates um, and, uh, and other you know, difficulties in terms of downward, uh, downward pressure on private payer reimbursement rates. The hospitals are certainly doing everything they can to become more efficient, which is not to say there's not more that they could do. Yeah, so um, I, I, th I, think it, I think if a hospital was made to look at trying to keep costs down, that's the goal. Try, and I know they probably do it. But in this case, I had, again, four different doctors with both my mother and me that they weren't communicating with each other. And then they were asking us the same question and taking up the time and same, you know, it's just like I could see a tremendous waste here. If one doctor did it and they all communicated, they didn't have to visit. So just that was a small example, but I, I could I could see that if we really made it an effort to cut costs, we could probably do that within the hospitals. But I, I agree, we shouldn't blame the hospitals for the um, we, you know the rising cost of healthcare. I think it's um, it's a number of reasons. But I, again, I want to thank you you all for your testimony. I think uh, we really have to get busy and and try uh, try to cut costs, but without you know like I said, compromising healthcare. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Rich. Thank you, member. Thank you, Councilmember Holden. We will now turn to Councilmember Eugene. Time starts now. Councilmember, you are on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right, thank you very much. Let me uh, thank and commend uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you so very much. And I want to thank also all the speakers for their testimonies, a lot of information. That's very wonderful. One of the things that I should uh, uh, mention, comment on, and we all agree that the hospital, they are doing a wonderful job. The doctors, the nurses, the medical professionals, they are doing a wonderful job, saving people all the time, in good time and bad time. And uh, uh, what I want to... Uh, comment on and also ask a question about is about the system used for the, the you know for the uh, to provide services to provide medical services and you know that uh, medical services is is a is a, is an obligation of all of us you know hospital society government and we got to make sure that we get a system funded to everybody everybody that everybody can use the system without having the consequences of not having, not uh, receiving, you know, the help that they are looking for. And also a system that won't create uh, challenges for them and put uh, the, the financial situation in jeopardy and even their families. So uh, we know that uh, everything now should go through computers. We're using computers and we're using technology for everything. But the, there is a, there's a, a large number of people in our society in New York City. They are not computer li literate. They are not in the technology that we are using. And those people, they are entitled to the same services that we as a society, as government, as country, we should provide. And uh, many times, many of them, they get to the hospital. They don't have a clue about the difference between the insurance, this insurance and that insurance. They don't have a clue about the cost of the procedures. They just go through. And after that, they end up going to, uh, to, uh, to situation. The credit uh, is messed up and, and all the other consequences. My question is, uh, what can we do? I think that something, before I ask the question, I think that we should do something. We should work together, hospital, insurance companies, government, to make sure that we provide information and knowledge, education, to those people who, can, who are not able, capable of using the system that we are using, computers and software technology. Number one, what is in place? And we can implement, I don't say recreate, but I know that we can do that. What is in place right now? to make sure that those people were not using computers. And I, I got to say also, we know that New York City is a city of immigrants. There are many people, they are immigrants. They are, you know, it's difficult for them to navigate through the system and navigate through the medical system is another big challenge for them. So what is in place we can implement 
to ensure that everybody can get access to the same quality of healthcare that we are providing. We are providing good state-of-the-art quality of healthcare. I know that. But what can we do to make sure we, do, we eliminate the health from, uh, inequity, the disparity that exists in health? Using yes. probably other people, mentoring them, educating them, creating them, promotion. What can we do if it doesn't exist already? That's an excellent question, uh, Council Member Eugene. And I think, you know, one of the things that a number of hospitals uh, did and started a while ago, but also picked up during the time when the state had the DISRIP Medicaid waiver, which you might be familiar with, um, which really focused on community care and really focused on trying to have community health workers um, that would go into communities and discuss in a culturally competent way with you know, you know, people who actually can speak the languages that need to be spoken in these communities and to try to educate people about their health insurance options, but also their health care options. Um, we've done a lot of this with 1199 and CIU through the Healthcare Education Project, but certainly it's something that really needs to be focused on. I think the community health worker model is one that is extremely important in communities like the ones you're talking about, where people don't have computers, where they might not even have, you know, broadband that works very well, even if they do have computers, um, who really need to be met where they are. And, where they live. and so I think that that is one of the models that I think the city has been looking at before, the state's been looking at, some hospitals have funded through um, state funding and federal funding, but I think that's a model that should be um, looked at um, much more carefully and supported over time because otherwise you're right, the disparities won't be solved if we don't really reach these people where they live. Uh, with your permission, Mr. Chair, this is my last question. Uh, you say that uh, you have been, the system have been looking into those uh, possibilities. But I see that a lot of effort, a lot of uh, ex, uh, uh, investment have been made in technology, in all hospital, in technology. The really that's remarkable, the effort that has been made, you know, to make sure that all the hospital, all the system use the technology. But I would appreciate if we can make the effort also to implement, to invest in education of the people. You mentioned the union, 1199, big union, a wonderful job. We can use those unions because they are powerful, they got the main power, and also other organizations to reach out the communities, to reach out with those people, because health, you know that. There's nothing, is priceless, there's nothing more important than health of people. So we have to make sure we establish a system where everybody can have the, 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 the exact, the, the, the same access to the quality of our health that we are providing. And again, thank you so very much for your testimony. And Mr. Chair, thank you so very much. I don't know if you want to comment on my last, uh, you know, statement. Hello. Thank you, thank you, Councilmember Eugene. Yes, um, so I will now again invite count other council members to raise their hands if they have a question. Um, seeing none, I will now turn it over to Chair Rivera to close out the panel. Thank you so much uh, for your testimony and for being here to answer our questions. I'm sure this conversation will continue. If there's any follow-up, we will be sure to contact the both of you. Thank you for giving your time. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Rivera. So we will now turn to our next panel to testify. Um, I would like to invite Senator Andrew Bernardes to testify. Um, so Senator, you may begin when ready. Great, thank you very much to Chairman uh, Levine and Chairwoman Rivera. Thank you for inviting me. I'm sorry I missed my call time earlier. Uh, and good morning, everyone. I really appreciate everyone's attention to this incredibly important issue. Uh, and, I, and I do think it's important to start off by saying that the topic that we're talking about today is not meant to be by any means an attack on healthcare workers, doctors, nurses, healthcare staff, uh, or to diminish or belittle the work that they've done, not just over the last 18 months, but the role that they play in our society. 
Uh, I think that's an incredibly important thing that we should just make clear up front. Uh, and you know, they pursue a profession because it, it's it's personal to them, and they are trying to provide uh, the, for the health being the well being and health of their patients. Uh, and what we're trying to talk about today is really about how do we ensure quality and affordable health care. You know, there's a lot of conversation about the rise in hospital prices, about what you know how how some of the factors uh, led to where we are today. The reimbursement rates from Medicaid, which I think everyone agrees are just fundamentally flawed, which is why many of our smaller hospitals have gone under. Even Medicare, which only accounts for 80 to 85 percent of reimbursement costs here in New York, um, and, and that should be looked at as well. But what we're what we're really driving at is the other extreme of that part of the spectrum is a system in which hospitals are able to charge more than 350 percent over the standard reimbursement rate. Uh, for basic procedures. We can all agree that 85% doesn't cover everyone's costs and we have to figure out an answer for that. But the answer cannot be, well, we're gonna more than triple what the cost is in order to make up for that difference. That system is just unsustainable. And that system leads to a situation where working class New Yorkers, whether they uh, work for the public sector, work for the private sector, the individuals who just need access to quality, affordable health care, regardless of where it is, are simply unable to afford it any longer. Uh, that is really what this entire conversation is about. And there is no one symptom to that problem, but a big part of this conversation and a big part of this problem that we've been able to identify has been the way that our large hospital networks have been able to leverage their market power and their size to dictate the terms in many ways uh, that patients have to pay because they negotiate with their insurance companies and there's multiple plans and we all we heard all of that but at the end of the day when those costs get driven up to 350 percent what the standard reimbursement rate is it's not the insurance company paying that it's the patient that's money coming out of a patient's paycheck that's money coming out of someone's pocket and without being able to explain with a straight face as to why those costs are so egregiously high what we are doing is subsidizing these large hospital networks that are overcharging our working class New Yorkers, and we're doing so on the backs of people who can least afford it. That is why one of many topics of conversation that have to be looked at in this conversation around providing affordable and quality health care has to be the contracting practices that are used by hospitals in their negotiations with insurance companies that set the terms of payment out of reach for everyday New Yorkers. That is the purpose of the legislation that I have sponsored with my colleague, Assemblywoman Catalina Cruz, who I know spoke earlier. And we are trying to say that you cannot use anti-competitive practices. You cannot try to leverage your size and your power to dictate the terms and the payment that you're gonna receive without transparency, without accountability, and without any type of justification. That is the whole purpose of this legislation. And at the end of the day, the people that we're fighting for is we are fighting for every single person in this state who needs to go to a hospital to get health care, their health care needs met, whether that is a complicated process or a simple process or anything in between. What we are talking about is making sure that we don't send people into financial ruin because they are being expected to pay 350% more than what the average payment is for the same exact treatment at the hospital down the block. Uh, you know, some discussion was made earlier about how our hospital system here is already very competitive. And I think the point was made in response to that, that people don't shop around for their health care the way they do for their car or for their house. They go where their doctor is. They go with wherever they know to go, wherever their friend tells them, wherever their family tells them. They don't have the average patient does not have the ability to price shop to see where they should go get their colonoscopy, where they should go get their annual physical, where they should go for their x-ray. It's just not the way that people pursue or engage with the healthcare marketplace. So the, the analogy saying that this is already an over-regulated and over-competitive market just doesn't apply, I think, in the everyday lived experiences of New Yorkers who are trying, again, just to get access to quality and affordable healthcare. So I really wanna thank the council for shining a light on this issue today, for helping to tease out some of the nuances and some of the complexities and tech, and and, and technical issues surrounding hospital billing practices. I think it's an important topic that needs to be continued to discuss. Uh, and we will certainly take whatever feedback we're able to learn from today's hearing and use that uh, in the upcoming legislative session up in Albany, both myself and my co-sponsor in the assembly, Catalina Cruz, uh, and, and make sure that we, we find a way to solve 
this part of the larger healthcare problem in our country. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senator. I'm now gonna turn it to the chairs. Chair Levine. Well, just briefly, I wanna thank you, Senator Gunardis and uh, Assemblymember Cruz for speaking today, for leading on this. The problem is so big, it's so complicated. We need action at all levels of government. We need federal, state, and local action. And I'm um, really happy to be partnering with, with you and Assemblymember Cruz and appreciate you both appearing today. Thank you so much. Thank you. I just wanted to also thank the Senator for his leadership and we absolutely agree with you and are thankful to all of the healthcare workers, executives, administrative staff. And, and so thank you for what you're doing in Albany. Thank you all. Thank you, Senator, and thank you, Chairs. We will now turn to our next panel. So I would like to welcome Kyle Bragg to testify. Following Kyle Bragg, we will hear from Cora Opsell, Jeffrey Sorkin, Renny Cassiano, and Jimmy Brennan. Um, Kyle Bragg, you may begin when ready and once the sergeant cues you. Thank you and good morning to our co-chairs, uh, uh, Councilwoman Carolina Rivera and uh, Councilman Mark Levine. I wanna thank our co-sponsors of HEAL, uh, Assemblywoman Catalina Cruz and uh, Senator uh, Andrew Granades uh, for their work in this very important matter. Like Senator uh, Granades, I wanna also open up by saying that, uh, be very clear that our dispute, this fight as you have it, uh, is not with our brothers and sisters, 1199, DC 37, NISNA, the interns and residents or all the other value healthcare professionals and workers who provide, you know, uh, heroic service uh, every day uh, during the course of this pandemic and long before this pandemic. Be very clear that our issue was with those who are responsible for setting pricing for the procedures that are grossly vary across hospital systems. So good morning. My name is Kyle Bragg and I'm the president of SCIU 33J. And as you know, 33J SCIU is the largest property service workers union in the United States, representing over 90,000 hardworking New Yorkers who work as cleaners, property maintenance workers, doormen, security officers, window cleaners, building engineers, and school and food service workers. Our members keep New York running and throughout the pandemic, many of us have continued to show up every day to ensure that our city could function. In doing so, we've lost over 150 of our members, good souls who dedicated themselves as essential workers to the service of the city. At the heart of our union's work has been winning the mark, maintaining high quality healthcare benefits for members and the COVID-19 pandemic has only underscored how vital these benefits are for our workers and their families. These benefits include premium free family coverage, low co-pays and a network of thousands of doctors that have real life changing impacts on the quality of life of our members. Unfortunately, these benefits are jeopardized by the skyrocketing New York hospital costs. Several years ago, our health fund and our union began looking at this issue because our health fund and many union health funds are self-insured. We pay all our members bills for care, including the ever rising hospital costs. Our fund has no profits or shareholders and no interest other than providing workers with the highest quality health care that they can afford. Empire Blue, Cross, uh, Blue Shield administers the 32 bj health funds network authorizes our medical care and pays claims using members' money. The funds uh, pay Empire a flat administrative fee for their services, but the funds pay all medical claims. Every dollar spent on higher price health care is a dollar that can be used to make other kinds of quality and affordable care available to funds participants, offers much needed wage increases and other benefits. Our health fund has analyzed our payment data and what we found is truly shocking. To begin with, we found that the five major private hospital systems in New York City, New York Presbyterian, Montefiore, Time York, expired. NY Langone, Northwell, and Mount Sinai are charging our fund an average of 316% of what these same hospital charge Medicare for the exact same procedures that this cost of funds our members hundreds of millions of dollars over the past decade. In fact, our healthcare costs had simply risen at the same rate as inflation over the past decade. Our members could have received nearly 5,000 more in their pockets and wages this year without costing our employees a cent more than the current total compensation. 
For all hardworking members trying to raise families in an expensive city, this would make a world of difference. Secondly, we have found real extreme differences in what our health fund pays for the same care at different, at different hospitals. The, the significant disparity in prices for the same care at different hospitals lacks rational justification. And we aren't talking about groundbreaking new procedures. For example, our health fund paid an average of 83,000 for hip replacement at New York Presbyterian, but an average of 58,000 other New York hospitals, millions of dollars are being lost when hospitals overcharge us for care and it has to stop. Before I go on, I wanna make a few things clear. It's very important to understand, as I said, this fight is not with hardworking doctors and nurses and medical staff. Second, it's crucial that we understand that price and quality are not the same. Our pri priority is always to maintain high quality healthcare for our members, but there's no clear link between hospital costs and hospital quality. In fact, many low cost hospitals have high quality patient outcomes. Finally, I wanna say that this is not just an issue for 32BJ members, this is an issue for all New Yorkers. The cost of healthcare are rising for everyone. And whether you pay for your healthcare directly, get it through an employer plan or a member of a union, that cost is affecting you. And that's why we have convened coalition of public hospitals, including many other unions, healthcare advocacy, and community-based and health and faith-based organizations. We also believe that it's impacting our city. New York City government is the largest purchase of healthcare in the city, covering many times the number of lives that our fund does. And there's no reason to believe that this city is getting better dealing with than our fund is. We hope that we can hear from the administration soon about the city's hospital spend looks like, but it's simply uh, explore exploring from our own fund uh, and assumes that the city spends the same percentage of its health care expenses on hospital costs and would achieve the same savings as our fund would if we were charged Medicare rates. We estimate that the city might, may be losing over $2 billion to hospital overpricing. Beyond that, these incredibly wealthy hospitals all claim nonprofit status, therefore do not pay taxes further depriving the city of revenue despite their profit-seeking behavior. Thank of all the good we could do for our citizens if we spent that money on city employees and services rather than on wealthy hospitals. New York, New Yorkers everywhere are paying the price of predatory hospital pricing. We are paying for it directly. We are paying for it with the depressed wages and fewer jobs, and we're paying for it with our own tax dollars being wasted. It is time for our city to get serious about this problem and use every tool in the tool belt to hold high price hospitals accountable. 30 Jay is proud to be part of this fight. I want to thank the council for holding this important hearing and to encourage you to continue to take action. Thank you for your time very much. Thank you for your testimony. Um, council member Brooks Powers, I see that you were back on after having dropped off the Zoom. Um, so we see you and we'll call on you after the chairs and once this panel is complete for your question. Um, and so we will continue with our panel now. I would like to call on um, Cora Opsal to provide testimony. You may begin once you're unmuted and ready. Time starts now. Good morning. My name is Cora Opsal and I am the interim director of the 32BJ Health Fund. We provide comprehensive health benefits to union members of SEIU 32BJ and their eligible dependents. We cover approximately 190,000 lives in 11 states with the bulk of our lives here in the New York City area. As a Taft-Hartley plan, our benefits are 100% funded by over 5,000 employers, some with thousands of employees and some with only one worker. We provide comprehensive health benefits to our participants with no participant premiums or deductibles and low copays. We are also a self-funded plan. This means all medical claims are paid by the 32BJ Health Fund. While we use an insurance company to administer our benefit, the cost of the care provided to our plan participants is paid by us. That means as hospital and medical costs go up, those costs are passed directly onto the 32BJ Health Fund. The 32BJ Health Fund receives all of our medical claims. This means we can see where our participants get care and how much it costs. This amount of data has allowed us to analyze our claims and know exactly how we are spending our healthcare dollars. For example, in 2019, the 32BJ Health Fund spent $929 million on all of our health benefits, including medical, prescription drugs, vision, dental, and other ancillary benefits. Of that $929 million, 82% of the benefit dollars, or $743 million, were spent on hospitals, doctors, and medical staff. Of that $743 million, 68% of the costs, 
or 505 million were for hospital costs alone. That means hospital costs made up 50% of our total spending in 2019. Hospital prices are the number one driver of, of costs in healthcare, not just for us, but for the entire healthcare industry. Over the past decade, premiums and deductibles have outpaced wages. That means healthcare not only got more expensive, but it cost more for patients and plans like ours. As we look at healthcare costs, Medicare prices provide a good benchmark for comparison of commercial prices or prices paid by self-funded plans like us. We use our own claim data and analyze what we would have paid had we paid Medicare prices for hospital services here in New York City. We looked at our data from 2016 through 2019 and determined that the prices charged for hospital service provided to our participants were 240% higher than what Medicare charged for the same set of services. What that means is, had we paid Medicare prices instead of the high prices charged by hospitals, we would have spent 58% less during that time period. Additionally, we were able to see the high variation between hospital systems within the city. Looking at just the private hospital systems in New York City, their prices paid by the fund are 316% higher than Medicare prices. Time expired. To understand what that means in real dollars, let's look at two common procedures, colonoscopies and vaginal births. For a standard colonoscopy, the average amount we paid the highest price hospital in 2018 and 19 was $9,598. At the same hospital, Medicare would have reimbursed $1,043. That is 9.2 times the amount Medicare paid for the same routine procedure. Looking at the same time period for a vaginal birth, we paid the most expensive hospital an average of $24,810. Medicare would have paid the, the hospital $9,149, or 2.71 times less than what we paid. Setting Medicare aside, comparing what we paid for a colonoscopy and a vaginal birth in a more expensive hospital system to what we paid on average to the rest of the hospital systems in New York City, the difference is still staggering. For a colonoscopy, we paid approximately $9,000 at the more expensive system, while we paid an average of $4,000 at other less expensive hospital systems. For a vaginal birth, the costs average $24,000 versus $20,000 elsewhere. There is no reason the cost variation should be so high for these procedures. A common justification given for the higher cost is that cost equals quality. However, that is untrue. A 2018 RAND study looked at the correlation between hospital costs and quality. They compared low, medium, and high cost hospitals based on their prices in comparison to Medicare and then looked at the quality data. The results are clear. Higher cost hospitals do not have better quality scores than those that are medium or low cost. We've also seen this in our own maternity and joint replacement program. Quality is not dependent on the price charged by the hospital. Lastly, it is important to comment on the anti-competitive nature of the contracts, contracts between hospital systems and insurers. As a self-funded plan, we make benefit decisions in the best interest of our participants. However, hospital systems can enter into contracts with insurers that restrict our ability to provide high quality care programs to our participants and to design our benefits to encourage these participants to use high quality, lower cost hospitals. For example, the 32BJ Fund offers a maternity program for our participants where they can have a baby for a $0 copay if they use one of our high quality partner hospitals. Hospitals had to submit an application to be included in our maternity program and we did extensive, extensive vetting of the hospitals to ensure they are high quality and would provide an excellent experience for our participants. And our participants are extremely satisfied. But based on the language in a contract between a hospital system and insurance company, we, we could have been required to shut down our maternity program, which would have taken away the ability for our participants to have a baby with no copay. No hospital should be able to exercise this type of control over health plans not fair to our participants or any health plan. In conclusion, high hospital prices will continue to drive up healthcare costs, costing plans like ours millions of dollars in unnecessary spending. Thank you for holding this hearing and bringing light to this ongoing problem. Thank you for your testimony. Um, we will now turn to our next panelist. Um, our next panelist will be Jeffrey Sorkin. Um, you may begin when ready and when cued by the um, by the sergeant. Thank you. Time Thank starts you now. Much.
Thank you very much. My name is Jeff Sorkin. I am the executive director of the United Federation of Teachers Welfare Fund. And what my organization does is we provide access to health benefits to over 400,000 members. Now, I would like to start today by highlighting that New York City spent nearly $3 billion paying for hospital bills in 2021. That's a 50% increase from the $2 billion we spent just five years ago in 2016. It is time to intervene. Mainly driving this outrageous surge are double-digit increases in hospital costs. We can't maintain this status quo. It is time to address it before it becomes a fiscal crisis. New York City's health benefits program, which we are a part of, is a self-funded insurance plan that pays hospital claims using city taxpayer dollars. For educators and UFT members, this means the more money we spend on paying hospital claims, the less money we have to invest in education and to better pay our educators. When money is spent on hospitals instead of education, it impacts the city's ability to attract top talent, and there's less money to improve our public schools by doing things like lowering class size. Now, there is a distinct lack of transparency and anti-competitive behavior exhibited by the largest city hospital networks. They should be blamed for the surge in hospital costs. Hospital contract negotiations are plagued with complicated rules and a lack of transparency with pricing. This ultimately allows the biggest players in the city's hospital system to raise their prices six to 10% every year. Presently, hospital networks like New York Presbyterian charge two to three times more for a routine medical service than other hospital networks that provide the same quality of care. For example, a normal pregnancy delivery at Presbyterian in 2018 cost 50% more than a normal delivery at Mount Sinai, Lenox Hill, and LIJ. Along the same lines, a hip replacement at Presbyterian cost $83,000, while others charge $58,000. Standard hospital admission costs in New York City hospitals range from $12,000 to $36,000 at others. We really need to rein this in and get it under control. This type of disparity shouldn't exist, especially when most are providing the same quality of care. It is, a it is time to address the gouging. It's time to get more transparency. We need hospitals mandated to disclose pricing information when we negotiate our contracts. We also need hospitals to stop steering our members away from innovative treatments that competitors offer. Those treatments may be less expensive, and more importantly, they may save lives. We need to level the playing field so that all hospitals are on equal footing, and we don't have some charging Hi, excess prices compared to others that offer the same quality of care. Hospitals cannot continue to demand double-digit increases every single year while they gate excuse me, while they gouge taxpayers and patients for the cost of routine medical care. Again, thank you for holding this hearing today. Our healthcare costs are ballooning. It doesn't have to be that way. We need to address the lack of transparency and the anti-competitive behavior demonstrated by some in the city's system. Together, I know we can find a solution before this becomes a fiscal crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, I've seen we've been rejoined by Henry Garrido, who we will call on next. Following Henry Garrido, we will hear from um, Renny Cassiano and Jimmy Brennan. Um, Henry Garrido, you may begin once you are ready and once the sergeant cues you. Thank you. Time starts now. Good afternoon, um, uh, Chair Slabine Rivera and all the members of the committee. My name is Henry Garrido. I'm the executive director of District Council 37, which represents 150,000 active members, uh, almost 100,000 retirees, and we provide insurance for their families, a supplemental benefit for their families and the support. I have also co-convened the Coalition for Affordable Hospitals, an issue that has never been more pressing than it is today. Two years ago, I addressed this joint committee and identified several reasons uh, several health costs that had risen in the last decade. I offer then suggestions to control what was then an unsustainable situation for uh, those that are most in need uh, of help. Today, I appear before you once again to discuss the skyrocketing cost of healthcare, 
Sadly, the situation has not got has gotten worse. Uh, due to the financial strain caused by COVID-19 pandemic, affordable health care is more of a priority now than ever before. It is imperative that all of us do what we can to immediately stem the tie of rising cost. Hospital calls in New York metro area are among the highest in the country, and spending it continues to grow more rapidly than the national average. Numerous studies have found the higher hospital pricing does not directly correlate to higher quality of care. Instead, every dollar that goes towards costs is $1 less that could have gone for wages, for workers, uh, and in this case, improving government spending uh, to fund uh, important public services. To put a finer point on it, a fiscal year 2022 is projected that the city will spend $6.9 billion on healthcare. Um, that does not include supplemental benefits. Um, of that, 58% is going to hospital spending alone. Currently, we charge 200% over Medicare. Uh, if we were to charge rate, Medicare rates, the city would save $2.4 billion. Think about all we could do to improve public safety, for the homelessness, uh, for schools, for an additional $2 billion that could be saved as a result of just leveling the playing field. DC 37 and our fellow unions uh, that make up the Municipal Labor Committee recognize this fact and are doing our part to reduce hospital bills with changes in its design plan uh, of the healthcare. For example, none, uh, we have moved non-urgent but essential procedures uh, such as colonoscopies and infusion therapy from hospitals to outpatient I'm centers. Expired. We've changed our insurance copay structure to discourage members to utilize emergency room less uh, for non-injured treatment. We implement the wellness programs, diabetes disease prevention programs, and telehealth programs to improve our members' health and prevent hospitalization. And we look to implement um, every way that we can possible to uh, rely less and less on hospitals to provide quality care. Um, I understand my time has expired. We will submit our testimony for the record. But one thing I would say to you is we need to support the HEAL Act that is being sponsored by Senator Andrew Gunardis and Assemblyman uh, Catalina Cruz. We need this and we need it um, now. Thank you for hearing us and thank you for your support and your leadership on this matter. We will submit written testimony for the record. Thank you, uh, chairs, thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. We will now turn to our next two panelists. Um, I'd like to welcome Rennie Cassiano to uh, testify once you are ready and once the sergeant cues you, thank you. Time starts now. Hello. My name is Renee Cassiano. For over 20 years, I have worked at Columbia University's Business School as operations staff. I am also a member of UAW Local 2110. I now serve as the full-time union chairperson for the Local 2110 Bargaining Unit at Columbia University. As a union representative, I have been part of the bargaining committee at Columbia University and have seen firsthand the impact of the cost of healthcare on negotiations in Local 2110 we have been determined to preserve affordable health care for, for the membership. As a union, we have fought hard and have gone on strike to maintain our health care. As a member of Local 2110, I'm very proud of these fights that our members mounted, but it is wrong that our members are forced to go through the hardship and sacrifice of a strike simply to maintain what should be the absolute right of every human being, high quality health care for themselves and their families. Even when we haven't had to strike to keep our health care, the university takes the position that because of the cost of health care, we have to take less in wages. Every time we go into, into negotiations with the university, the cost of health care hangs over our heads and affects our overall settlement. Our members have to choose between trying to keep affordable health care and having less money to survive in this expensive city where the cost of rent and transportation is so high. Columbia is a very rich employer with, 10, with a $10 billion endowment, yet it uses the excuse 
of the cost of its health care to force the lowest paid workers to take less, either through accepting a worse health a worse health plan or lower wages. I am lucky enough to, I am lucky enough to have a union job that at least gives me the opportunity as a worker to have a seat at the table. What about the workers who don't have unions and work for employers that don't have such deep pockets? We asked the city council to do everything possible to, to take the profiteering out of healthcare. Ultimately, we need a single payer health plan, but until we have a federal solution, we ask the council to take these interim steps to control hospital costs. Uh, I would like to thank Co-Chair Levine and Co-Chair Rivera for uh, allowing me the opportunity to speak of uh, the issues at my local. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you so much for your testimony. We will now turn to our final panelist of this panel. Um, I would like to invite Jimmy Brennan to testify. You may begin once you are ready and once the Sergeant cues you. Thank you. Time starts now. Morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for the opportunity to speak to you this morning. Uh, my name is Jimmy Brennan. I was born and raised in New York City. And like many of you, I'm still a resident of the greatest city in the world. I'm one of nine children and over 30 cousins coming from a traditional Irish American family. We're all born in New York City hospitals and covered under our parents' union health plans at the time. Having to pay out of pocket for their childbirth to the New York City hospital for my generation of my family, it would have bankrupted each and every one of our parents, the most working couples at that time and still today. Growing up as a kid in a concrete jungle like NYC, my siblings and I were no strangers to emergency rooms. The basic medical needs that children acquire as they grow are not an option, they are a necessity. Fortunately, our parents were able to secure positions as union workers whose benefits package provided a health care plan for them and their families. Without their health benefits, our parents would have accumulated debt that would have prevented them from keeping their commitment to give their children a higher level of education and a better life than they received, as almost every parent sets out to do. Having grown up in a union family, when I became of age, I set out to secure a union position that provided me the same security and same benefits that I grew up with. I was first hired by a Manhattan property as a doorman at 17, and four years later at a different property in Manhattan, I became a superintendent at 21. I am now a resident manager in the Upper East Side where I've worked for the previous 19 years. As with most young adults, my need for medical attention was minimal, if any. Dentist visits aside, I didn't require much from my medical benefits plan. As a young guy, first Thursday of every Thursday, uh, first check on every Thursday, rather, um, I felt my union dues were a waste of money when they were deducted from my paycheck. And that all changed when I was 26. In the summer of 2006, I suddenly became severely ill and the cause could not be diagnosed by my regular doctor nor the specialist he recommended. Due to the lack of diagnosis, my illness progressed and as a result of constant vomiting, was 80 pounds in two months. I was forced in September of 2006 to admit myself to Lenox Hill Hospital because the illness left me completely helpless. The hospital stay this time was for 29 days. I was unfortunately placed in ICU because air had entered my chest cavity, which can cause severe cardiac arrest, if not removed. Having a priest come to give last rites and having your father throw him out of the hospital room was a very unique moment for me at 26. And I was diagnosed with gastroparesis, which is a paralysis of the stomach muscles. It is a rare disease that affects about 2% of humans worldwide. So yeah, I, I hit the, the lotto you don't wanna hit. Um, once my vomiting was, brought in, vomiting was brought under control in the hospital, I was allowed to go home. I've been forced to change my lifestyle and completely change what I eat. It's a very difficult process to go through as a young person 26. Over the next eight years, I was hospitalized regularly because once the vomiting returned and reached the point where blood was the only thing that came up, only hospital care would stop the vomiting. I was a patient in almost every major hospital in New York City and a few outside our boroughs. I'm excited. Of my hospital, hospital stays, testing and continuing doctor's visits for that eight year period well exceeded half a million dollars. If I was not a union worker who had medical benefits at that time, I may not be here today to tell you my story. If I was made to cover those costs out of pocket, I would have had to work the next 30 years to pay those costs. Because I'm a member, a proud member of Local 32BJ, who has an outstanding medical plan for their members, I stand before you here today. In 2010, I was asked by the leadership of 32 Kyle specifically to join their executive board here in New York. Shortly thereafter, I was appointed to serve as a committee member of the bargaining committee for the residential contract negotiations that covers some 40,000 workers here in New York City. I was able to see firsthand how difficult our leadership works during every negotiation just to maintain the benefits that we already had secured. In our last bargaining session, 40 cents of every dollar we secured from our employers 
to be allocated to keep our health plan for our members. Given the cost of living in our city, we should strive to secure increases in our contract and keep up with the cost of living. Due to the fact that hospital and medical costs rise higher annually than the cost of living and most other products and services, it is almost impossible for us to secure to wage increases while our health care costs continue to skyrocket at uncontrolled and unprecedented rates. Our health fund directors work diligently to ensure that the funds in our health care fund are properly allocated on behalf of our members. Hospital price gouging is one of the leading challenges that we face as a union today and is the largest driving factor for the increase in our health care costs. The rate of increase of hospital costs are not sustainable. This coming April, we'll begin a new round of bargaining for our 40,000 residential workers here in New York City. These men and women, for the first time in over our 80 year history of 32 BJ, received the title of essential worker during the pandemic. Our members showed up every day to perform and served our city when we saw the largest exodus in our city's history. They didn't flee, they didn't secure themselves in their bunkers. We're 32. We don't do that. We do what we're trained to do, and that's run New York City. There were zero interruptions of the services provided by our members in their properties across this great city. The building service industry had one of the highest death rates during the peak of the pandemic. Due to the pandemic, the importance of maintaining our quality health care has never been more of a priority for our leadership. Now, more than ever, we must stand together as one to fight against hospital price, price gouging maintain our health benefits and thus our quality of life so that we continue to serve this great city as we have for the last 80 years and for the next 80 to come. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, we will now turn to the chairs for questions. I'm first gonna to turn to Chair Rivera. Well, thank you so much for being here. Just a, a couple of general questions. Some of it was touched upon in your testimony. And again, I wanna thank you all for your time and your patience and, and staying um, uh, to share your words and some of the experiences of your members, direct experiences clearly. But what have your members' experiences been like with seeking care within New York City hospitals? And what more can the city do to ensure affordability across our hospital systems? I know there Fairly different questions, but if I could just pose that to the panel of anyone who'd like to weigh in. What have your members' experiences been like uh, with seeking care within New York City hospitals? And what more can the city do to ensure affordability across our hospital systems? Um, thank you uh, for that question, uh, Councilwoman. Uh, first, I, you know, our members are receiving uh, good and quality care. Uh, in the hospital systems in New York City. That's not what's at issue here. What's at issue is them receiving the quality care uh, from these uh, healthcare professionals, but uh, us having to pay this outrageous uh, uh, cost through the pricing, which is totally subjective. Uh, you know, you know we, the healthcare professionals that provide the care to our members are, again, providing excellent care to our members. The problem is that it shouldn't vary across hospital systems. We shouldn't have to pay uh, double the amount for a procedure at, from, from one hospital to another. It just doesn't add up. I've heard them talk about uh, operational costs, but it, or, or whether you're a teaching hospital, there are teaching hospitals and the, and the pricing uh, that exists for procedures just don't equate you know, to, to, the, to, to, that, to that explanation. So um, I think that what the city can do is to continue to push back against uh, what is happening uh, through, through these hospital systems about this uh, unfair and unjust and very subjective pricing uh, 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 policies and procedures. And because the dollars that they spend, which I think is somewhere near 7 billion and if, if, it's, and if it's relation to, uh, to our health fund spend, it'd be half of that is, is coming from hospital uh, uh, prices. And so, that's money that can be going back into the coffers of our city and going back into the, the pockets of workers uh, of this city. What, and what do you if my uh, Madam Chair, I, some time ago, about, I would say about four or five months ago, the city, the unions had meetings with some of the hospital heads um, that in order to have conversations to say, listen, if, if this situation continues, where the pricing is so vastly different for the same services, 
we may be forced to do some other things like an RFP or something to that. It, some of the hospitals came in very candidly and said, there are things that we can do to improve access to quality care. Uh, institutions like Sloan Kettering Cancer Center came in and said, you know, we, we want to make uh, some of these things available to your members and, and to the workers. Other hospitals like Columbia Presbyterian refuse to even meet with the city and the unions. This is a lot. When the city of New York convened by the mayor and the heads of the unions representing 1.3 million lives, convened meetings for the hospitals and some of those hospital systems did not even have the decency to reply. And so it makes the conversation very difficult because their bluff is if you don't want to pay up 60, 75% over the other hospitals, then we'll just put you out of network and your members will not have access to that care. And that to me is a, is a mentality that needs to change. And I think that one of the things the city could do and the city council can do is as my brother Kyle said, continue to push for transparency in billing. I think if people were to see more clearly what we're being charged with, I think the situation was charged. It would change completely. And I think that we need to continue to uh, file. And a lot of those hospitals have made it clear that they don't want that transparency in billing to be clear, to be uh, apparent. And I think that's one of the ways that you, the city can help us with this. And I, I would add that, um, you know, what we've done was extrapolate from our own uh, uh, payments uh, hospital payments from our fund to assume that the city spends uh, pretty much the same percentages on their health care expenses and the hospital costs. And I think that if uh, we were able to uh, join uh, with the city uh, to uh, use our collective buying power to demand a fairer uh, hospital prices, that would be something that uh, would certainly uh, go a long way in attacking this issue. I agree, and I and I know that um, they're hearing our message loud and clear. You know, I, I have a, a bit of a about the the health fund because I know how important it is to your members, and and anyone can weigh in. I know Corey, you certainly can. Many union health funds, including the 32BJ Health Fund, are self-insured, which means that they pay all members' bills for care. And so my understanding is that. 57.5% of New Yorkers who have health insurance are in self-insured plans. Is that your understanding as well? Uh, I, I, I trust those statistics and I believe that that's right. Um, and again, you know, Empire doesn't make more or less based on how much we pay or how much healthcare we use, you know, and, you know, we, you know, we have a flat fee. You know, our problem, again, is that, uh, you know, we can't have, uh, one, there's no transparency in how uh, these billing practices are, are taking place and are, are, are formulated. Uh, and uh, we, don't, we don't particularly have a say in, in, in how uh, uh, these hospital systems uh, create these, uh, these, 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 these billing, billing standards. So, um, you know, I... We, we, don't, we don't have a uh, particular love for anything in the system that uh, takes advantage of, of patients. Uh, but we, we believe that there is a serious problem uh, in that this hospital pricing uh, is, is, is so out of whack and, and varies across the systems for the same procedures that this, this has, that, that has, something has to be done about this. And we believe that uh, uniting with uh, those other private funds and with the city uh, using all our collective buying power can, can deal with this uh, uh, issue. So when Empire's acting as your third party administrator, they, they don't make a profit based on the cost or level of utilization of those healthcare services. That's correct. I, would, I, wouldn't, say that's, I wouldn't say that's correct. I, I, I wouldn't say that they don't make a profit, but what I would say is that we get to negotiate with uh, Blue Cross and Blue Shield what we pay, pay them to provide the service that they provide to us. What we don't get to do is negotiate with the hospitals about, you know, the, their, their pricing practices and, you know, how it varies across 
hospital systems. It's just ridiculous that you can go to uh, two hospitals within, as I think uh, Councilman Levine had stated, within the same borough, within a amount of miles of each other, and you pay thousands of dollars more for one procedure than you pay for another. And you and it, it just doesn't add up. It doesn't make sense. They 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 have the same operational costs. Uh, what, what I didn't hear from uh, Mr. Richardson about how he explains. That, uh, that 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 price varies uh, when they all uh, function under the same uh, 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 operational cost. Oh, correct. And I think that's you know those are those are the the big questions that we have is that you could have hospitals that are literally blocks away from each other, and the disparities are are wild. So I, I want to just thank you all for being here for answering my questions. I'll turn it over to to my co-chair to see if he has uh, any follow up questions for this uh, esteemed panel. Thank you so much, Chair Rivera, and thank you to this panel. Um, Executive Director Garrido, you brought up a point which uh, is so critical that I don't know if the public realizes that this crisis of, of pricing in hospitals directly impacts city government. It impacts our budget. It impacts the resources we have for all sorts of vital programs to deal with challenges in this city that, that you enumerated from education to housing, et cetera. Um, and you said a couple numbers that were just incredibly big that I, I want you just to repeat because they're so important. But um, you said that if hospital pricing simply was in line with what is paid for Medicare, it would save uh, literally billions of dollars. Could you just clarify that point? Yeah, I mean, we could save over $2 billion in just by leveling the playing field and and if we were to tie or index the cost of Medicaid. And I think that's pretty telling, right? Uh, in, in a city where it's a, because it's the same hospitals, right? And it's the same population to some extent. And the reason why I use Medicare as an example is because all the adults tend to cost more, right? There are more complications in health and, and done that than, uh, than others. So even if you use that as a measurement, you would save $2 billion. Um, I use this example quite often, right? When you look at the city budget, uh, since FY 2013, the largest growth of any expenditures by the city has been healthcare. And the number one reason for that has been hospitalization and the cost of the rising cost of prescription drugs. Hospitals, much more than drugs, than prescription drugs, that's a fact that we paid uh, $3 billion to provide health care for city uh, workers uh, and less than a billion of that was going to hospitals. Today, that number is over $4 billion. And in the matter of, of, of you know, a few years, the cost doesn't seem to be associated with any major you know, real estate expansion and booming because it's the same properties, right? The cost doesn't seem to be associated with index with wages and increases of the workers. It's pure price gouge. It's the idea that they provide what they provide and they can charge what they can charge. And we have the option to either pay up or be out of network. And that's incredibly unfair to the, the city workers, to the, the working people who have for years maintained those very hospitals, even when some of the question, the quality of the delivery was questioned. And so I think that we are at a point that if we continue to do this, we're going to collapse the health insurance benefit. Right? There's all this discussion about Medicaid and Medicare Advantage and everything else. Guess what? The hospitals, are one of the primary reasons why the cost of healthcare is threatened to undo the benefits that those people fought so hard to get. Exactly, and as we said here throughout the hearing, uh, the US is spending far more in healthcare than any other peer nation, but we're not getting more healthcare out of it. We're not getting better health outcomes out of it. We're just overpaying, and that, that unfortunately is true in New York. Um, We've talked about how, that, that hospital pricing is so opaque that it's, it's hard to even uh, get a fix on 
on just how wide the dispar disparities are for the same procedure in different hospitals, though we know it's, it's significant. And for that reason, the work that, that 32BJ has done is really important. You all have put some, some brain power and even data analytics in to try and get a better fix, uh, comparing procedure to procedure, hospital to hospital. And you've come up with some pretty incredible examples. But I have to say that the example, and, and I don't know if President Brad, we should cue core on this, but the example that you all have come up with with differential in uh, maternity costs for uh, traditional births is pretty shocking. Uh, so maybe Cora, because I, I think you probably have done a lot of research on this. Could you just illuminate that again? What is happening with the price disparity, disparity on um, those birthing procedures? Sure. So we'll just use a, a simple vaginal birth or, you know, as our, our example. What we found is in 2019, the average that we were paying in 2018 and 2019 for our highest price hospital was $24,000. And our low, and, but what we paid on average all the rest of the hospitals was $20,000. Our most recent statistics, when we start to look at it, it actually, the cost difference is closer to $28,000 to $20,000. So when we really start to look at this, is these higher priced hospitals are just continuing to charge more and more than what, you know, their, their, uh, their, their partner hospitals um, are charging. It, it, it is... So painful to hear that even a, in a procedure like that, uh, there's such profound disparity. Uh, and we know it impacts workers, it impacts unions, it impacts ultimately city government uh, in, in really negative ways. Um, I, I know that we have uh, council member uh, Brooks Powers waiting patiently to ask a question. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop there, but I wanna thank this panel for raising the alarm on this issue uh, for the work you've done uh, to build uh, the case here and for your advocacy and leadership. Um, we're, we're, we're proud to stand with you uh, in this fight. Thank you. Thank you, and Chair. I, I guess I'll pass it to Em if you want to cue uh, Council Member Brooks Powers. Thanks. Thanks, Chairs. Um, so as a reminder for Council Members, um, you can use the Zoom raise hand function if you have questions, and I'm going to turn it now to Council Member Brooks Powers. Time starts now. Okay, so it seems like we may have some um, technical difficulties with um, getting Council Member Brooks Powers on. So we will reach out to the council member. Um, seeing no other hands, I will now thank this panel for testifying and we can turn to our next panel. Um, so our next panel will be Anthony Feliciano, followed by Kristen Deacon, Amanda Dunker, Cynthia A. Fisher, and Mark Zezza. So I would like to invite Anthony Feliciano to testify. You may begin when ready and once the Sergeant cues you to begin, thank you. Time, time starts now. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Anthony Feliciano. I'm the director of the Commission on the Public Health System. I'd like to thank the City Council Hospital Committee and Health Committee for holding this hearing today. Uh, I wanted to begin with saying that disparities are also found in the quality and care provided by the healthcare system, especially for black, indigenous and people of color. For the um, sense of time right now, I won't go over every piece, but my testimony covers several factors contributing to the disparity around cost and care, the quality of it. Um, and there are other um, aspects of this, but I wanna go directly to the recommendations given that I have a short amount of time. Um, I believe that the New York City Department of Health, the city controller office, along with the city council could jointly conduct an analysis comparing the actual cost to care for a similar patient in different hospitals and build off of what the unions have been doing. Currently, the city DOA does review together both hospital institutional wide costs, which are ICRs, and patient specific discharge data through SPARCs. However, it may need some um, reliable variables that can be married to current data collected. This is important because costs derived from billing data are based upon what is submitted by a facility to the state and may not necessarily reflect a final price of the service delivered. The other recommendation I would say, investigate hospitals with high cost services for common diagnoses that are displaying lack of services to low income immigrants and communities of color. 
especially for self-paid uninsured individuals and families. The Centers for Medicaid CMS implemented a rule in January 1st that required hospitals to post their standard charges online. And while we understood from advocates that there are still issues, New York City can demonstrate where we are better, including looking at the relationship between hospital cost data and overall price in index to see any correlation between the cost and medical services and overall cost of living as well. Access to the social economic impact of New York City of New York is providing. We also should look at the 669 million or more in real, real property tax exemptions to private not-for-profit healthcare providers. The city and the state should reconsider the tax benefits, the permitting and the zoning exceptions awarded to private and voluntary hospitals if it's not about caring for the sick and creating fair costs for services and treatment. Also create a citywide stakeholder group that has equal representation of community advocates and labor, health facilities and insurance plans to discuss a true path for transparency around costs and quality of care. I would include both city and state departments of health to the stakeholder group. In addition, the stakeholder group must be open to the public to attend. My other recommendation is the city council should pass intro 1674, which established an office of hospital patient advocate that I know uh, Councilman Carlina has been advocating for and use that ability for that office to help with around price transparency as well. We also think we have to monitor closely all the hospitals and health plans to ensure that validated measures do address both disparities in cost and care, especially as, Medicare, especially as Medicare reimbursement transitions from fee-for-service to value-based purchasing. I would <laughs> add that we should discuss ways that the Committee of City Healthcare Services could review both current workforce and community access to affordable health care and prices. This committee was created under Local Law 6 in 2018. I think we need to revisit into 973A, which was amending the charter to establish an Office of Comprehensive Community Health Planning and Interagency Coordination Council on Health. I also believe that we should continue advocating the governor at the state to sign bills around the indigenous care pool. Obviously, the indigenous care pool will create some equity issues that we've been seeing around distributing dollars there. I also understand we addressed the state heal bill. Um, and, and we know that it's improving hospital pricing transparency and ending anti-competitive hospital contracting practices. However, some of the provisions will have unintended consequences around access, patient choice, and overall support for wellness initiatives. I refrain to add more because we believe that these areas can be discussed with 32BJ and our labor partners one of the main advocates for the bill. We respect workers' rights, fair contracting over benefits and, labor, and the labor movement. We serve and work with and protect the same communities, especially people of color and immigrants. For that reason, we do not want to fall trap to the power and control fight between and the manipulation fostered by the Hospital Association and Insurance Industry Association. We have common goals with unions around cost transparency and affordability. I hope both parties can come to understanding around both community issues and work to each of our interests and concerns, particularly the workers' rights. At this point, we are not in support of HEAL. However, it does not mean we're not be in the near future based on what has been stated in my testimony earlier. And once again, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for your testimony. We will now turn to our next panelist. Um, Chris and Deacon, you may begin once the Sergeant cues you and once you are ready, thank you. Time starts now. Thank you. Um, so our, uh, I want to start with a quote. Um, our ho hospital's mission is to provide caring, high quality, fiscally responsible healthcare services that meet the needs and expectations of the communities we serve. This is a prominent New York hospital. Um, and I think this is a real example of a mission statement from you know, one of your hospitals, but also it's similar to those of all the other hospital systems in your city, um, indeed the state and the country. While I don't question the core mission of providing care and high quality healthcare services to the communities they serve, I do uh, question the proposition that there is any element of fiscal responsibility when it comes to hospital prices. I acknowledge and understand that there's never a good time to take on hospital prices, uh, especially given the pandemic. Um, in addition, policymakers are often pressured to protect their local hospitals and avoid much needed discussion about hospital pricing and transparency. But um, that task is essential if the nation is ever to get a grip on healthcare costs. Fully half of Americans now carry medical debt, up from 46% in 2020. 
Rising hospital prices are substantially to blame for this unacceptable state of affairs. As the former director of the state uh, of New Jersey health benefits program, which represents um, about 820,000 lives across state employees, local government and education employees, I not only have a unique perspective, I have a unique experience in dealing with the rise of healthcare costs. Um, you know, so aside from sort of this medical uh, debt that is crushing our middle and lower income classes and disproportionately impacting our communities of color, um, and those most vulnerable among us, why should we care about rising hospital prices as employers and public leaders? Um, what can we do about it? So the why. First, you know, hospital spending comprises the biggest chunk of healthcare spending, which drives up insurance premiums and out-of-pocket costs to our um, members. Even if you have a generous plan, um, like some of those discussed, um, with low out-of-pocket costs or no co-pays and deductibles, shielding your employees from the exorbitant costs of healthcare in the near term, it does not shield them from paying for it in different ways. Um, the main ways in which all of us, even those with Cadillac Plus Plus plans are um, in fact paying, is through increased health benefit premiums the following year. If you're in fully insured um, or self-insured, increasing an exorbitant hospital costs, um, which again, I think we've pointed out, have zero correlation to quality, will be passed on in the form of higher premiums the following year. Um, some public sector unions or groups, like some of the ones I worked with in the state of New Jersey, pay a, per a percentage of their salary for health benefits contributions, so they felt that I'm they were- expired protected, um, you know, wrong again. If increasing hospital costs lead to a net increase in healthcare expenditures for your employer, there will be invariable, invariably less money um, for compensation and raises, pension funding, et cetera. And finally, if you're one of those un uh, unicorn organization that sort of foots the entire bill for your, your employee, I'd like to think, you know, more uh, broadly about the opportunity costs that these high cost hospital costs um, lead to. If $1 out of every three healthcare dollars is spent on hospital costs, that represents today roughly 6% of the United States GDP. We spend less than 4% on education, less than 1% dealing and preparing uh, for climate change disasters, and less than 2.5% on infrastructure, um, and a percentage too small to even quantify on food and security. Are we getting better health outcomes? No. Is hospital care improving our health as a nation? No. Um, I think it's important to sort of talk about the narrative as well um, that we heard this morning. Um, you know, there are hospital executives that will take issue with this position and have on the record. And I've heard the plethora of reasons why, quote, hospital prices continue to rise and, and they go something like this. Um, public payers like Medicare and Medicaid underpay. Um, false. Medicare and Medicaid rates are not enough to sustain our business model. False. Um, we know that commercial, Medicare, commercial payers reimburse hospitals two and a half times more than Medicare on average. Yet, according to MedPAC, the Congressional Advisory Commission that sets reimbursement rates with multiple stake stakeholders input, including the hospital systems, Medicare payments are structured to cover 8% more than hospitals allowed variable costs. Perhaps 8% is too narrow of a margin, but is 250 to 400% really necessary? Another common theme, oh, but charity care. Uh, nope, again, not buying it. See the statistic above on medical debt. And in addition, it's actually pretty easy to learn about a hospital's case mix from their public CMS filings. And I have personally challenged this narrative um, with hospital CEOs in New Jersey when they cried charity care at a cost control advisory meeting. After pointing out that this particular institution's charity care as a percentage of case mix was under 2%, I pointed out that their 32% profit margin could more than adequately absorb these costs without charging the state health plan um, uh, multiples of CMS for services provided. An analysis by Politico has found that since the Affordable Care Act coverage expansion, revenue in the top seven nonprofit, nonprofit hospital systems um, increased by 15%, while charity care, um, the most tangible aspect of community benefit, has decreased 35%. Another theme you will hear, 
is owe our community impact. We cannot rubber stamp this category either. Um, fountains and glass atrium are not positive community impact, nor should a hospital's acceptance of Medicaid patients um, constitute community benefit either. Uh, while there are legitimate ways in which hospitals can and do give back to the communities they serve, the local community that is footing the bill and the hospital's tax break um, must have a say uh, in how that money is spent. Now I'm gonna quickly give you some very specific statistics to back up some of my claims taken from your very own hospitals in New York City based on their own public filings with the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services. Net profit margins range in the from New York City Health and Hospital System from a negative 12% profit margin to New York Pro Presbyterian topping out at 19% profit margin. Net assets range from a negative from some systems to um, on average most in the hundreds of millions sitting on assets to the higher side of Mount Sinai sitting on almost uh, 2.5 billion, NYU Langone over 3 billion, and New York Presbyterian sitting on assets of over $8 billion. With the exception of three hospitals in New York City, all had less than a 1% charity care case mix, while at the same time, a majority of these hospitals are charging multiples of the CMS rate, one in particular averaging over 380% of CMS for all inpatient and outpatient services. There is no amount. Um, put simply of charity, care, community impact that could justify such exorbitant costs that are borne by the city's taxpayers, employers, and employee residents. There's no obvious check to balance out the increasingly one-sided market that health benefits, uh, health, uh, that benefits from higher healthcare and hospital prices. Horizon, horizon, horizontal and vertical consolidation amongst hospital systems, the purchasing of physicians' offices, uh, really preying on them during a pandemic, and the building sprees um, in terms of actual land capital that these acquisitions have spawned are only leading to more upward pressure on hospital prices if we do not stand up and say, I'm mad as hell and I'm, gonna not, I'm not going to take it anymore. So now that we've spent most of my time talking about why it matters, um, sort of the easy part, now what can we do about it? Demand full transparency. The federal government has tried uh, through rulemaking to force hospitals to be more transparent with their prices, but due to meager enforcement and a lack of willingness of the hospitals to comply, we are left with little meaningful information. We must demand transparency through your self-funded contracts, um, through uh, your purchasing clout, and in law and regulation that you may control. You pay for it, demand to know the prices. Um, recognize that you have the buying power, buying power and use it. Self-funded payers have the market power to demand lower costs. The city of New York is the largest health purchaser in the city. The train, the train will only keep running away if we stand idly by and watch it. And a hospital, if a hospital is charging exorbitant fees, remove it from your network. Save your employees and your bottom line from these predatory practices. Um, I recognize my time is long past, so I, I will stop. And I am going to have to step away at one o'clock. Thank you so much for your testimony. We will now turn to Amanda Dunker. Amanda, you may begin once you are ready and once the sergeant cues you. Thank you. Time starts now. Um, I'm Amanda Dunker. I'm the Health Policy Director at the Community Service Society of New York, which is a 175-year-old charity um, in the city that advocates for, for low and moderate income New Yorkers. Um, before I start, I would like to recognize the extraordinary sacrifices that frontline hospital workers of all kinds have made during the pandemic. We're aware of those sacrifices, and, and as New Yorkers, we are so grateful for them. Um, the health programs at CSS serve 130,000 people every year. Um, and what we do is help people enroll in health insurance and then use it to access and afford health care. The people we serve have every type of insurance, public, private, fully funded, self-funded, and we also um, help people who don't have insurance. What we know from that work is that patients in New York are stuck in the middle of a battle between titans. So insurers on one side and hospitals on the other and patients in the middle. Our written testimony describes the consequences of that for patients and the disparities the system produces. Patients don't get care they need, they end up being put in collections, and they are even sued by the thousands by hospitals in New York, even though all of those hospitals are nonprofit charities. 
In a survey we did in 2019, New Yorkers blamed hospitals and insurers equally for their plight. And 69% said that hospitals charge too much. In that they are correct. Inpatient prices in New York State are 241% of Medicare prices on average, which is the highest in the entire country. New York City doesn't have authority or control over a lot of the factors that contribute to those high prices or the fact that, that patients are sort of stuck in the middle between these two big players. Um, a lot of the solutions that we endorse have to occur at the state level. So, for example, during the 1990s, New York State abandoned a statewide system of rate setting um, and health planning. Um, and that system had ensured that safety nets were receiving enough financial support to survive. When we lost that system, we lost a third of our bed capacity. And we are experiencing the consequences of that um, in terms of disparities and mortality rates during the pandemic. Um, the state could restore those systems. The state could look into strategies like Massachusetts Health Policy, Health Policy um, Cost Commission or Maryland's Global Payment System. And it could enact a single payer system like the New York Health Act. And CSS would endorse any of those approaches to controlling costs for patients. Um, respectfully, we, don't, we cannot endorse an approach taken like that in the, the HEAL Act, the legislation that others have mentioned today. Um, the HEAL Act is an attempt to adjust the balance between those titans, but we think and we are concerned that it does that in a way that might hurt patients. Um, its provisions could encourage those skinny, fragmented networks that are so difficult for patients to navigate. Um, and we feel that the price transparency provision in the Act does not go far enough because it would not increase price transparency for the public or the government. Um, we supported a policy last year as part of the Patient Medical Debt Protection Act that would have gone a lot further. Um, there are some steps that city council could take. Um, as I said, all these hospitals are, are nonprofits. Uh, the city could investigate their tax exemptions and zoning rules as they apply to hospitals. Um, I, Anthony, I believe, mentioned the Office of Patient Advocate. We endorse that um, as a way to listen to patients and give patients a, way, a place to go when they're having these issues. Um, and finally, we think the council could augment funding for community-based organizations that help people enroll in health insurance and then make sure that they can use it afterwards. So programs like Access Health NYC um, and the Managed Care Consumer Assistance Program, we think are at least a way to help navigate, um, navigate the system until we take some of those bigger steps I described at the state level. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. We are now going to turn to Cynthia A. Fisher, followed by Mark Zeza and uh, Rual uh, Rivera. So um, Cynthia A. Fisher, you may begin once you are ready and once the sergeant cues you. Time starts now. Thank you very much. It is an honor to uh, be here today uh, with the New York City Council members. And I thank you, Chairman Rivera, and also Chairman Levine uh, for the opportunity to speak. I am Cynthia Fisher. I am founder and chairman of patientrightsadvocate.org. And we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan um, that organization that seeks to have real prices, actual prices uh, disclosed through price transparency. Uh, giving all patients and consumers, that being employers, unions, taxpayers, patients, and their family members alike, the ability to know and see prices up front, benefit from competition, be able to compare prices, and through their own choices, uh, be able to get the best quality of care at the best and lowest possible price. We believe very firmly that the foundation of price transparency, healthcare price transparency system-wide, beginning with the hospitals and followed by the health insurers and plans showing all negotiated rates and all prices, will create a competitive functional marketplace where all employers, unions, and workers alike, as well as those on Medicare and Medicaid government-backed uh, systems, would be able to know the real prices. The beauty in price transparency is it will usher in quality transparency as well. And that would be transparency in services as well as outcomes. This is a huge win because price discovery will also usher in just what is the standard of care? What is the standard of care for a mammogram? And what should it cost? 
and we spoke today earlier with Cora's data of the prices and standard of care for childbirth. What is the standard of care and what should it cost? Those answers will all be disclosed when we have a functional competitive marketplace in healthcare. Well, the great news is that we had the support of three presidents, President Obama in the Affordable Care Act, uh, also put into law patients having the right to know upfront all charges in healthcare. That Affordable Care Act law was put into rule of law during the Trump administration and now embraced by the Biden administration. And in fact, because the hospitals have not been complying with this law, President Biden has put in place an anti-competitive practices organization to look at anti-competitive behavior of the hospitals and for not complying, raise the penalties. Um, however, we at, patient, we at patientrightsadvocate.org in July, did a report on 500 random hospitals in this country and looked at the compliance of these new laws. Remember, the American Hospital Association and hospital associations like Mr. Rich's all got behind the lawsuit to keep patients in the dark. They sued to not have this law be enacted and in place in rule of law, to keep patients in the dark, blind to no prices, enabled to surprise with large, outrageous, sometimes overpriced medical bills being blindsided, and then making every patient, whether they have coverage or not coverage or various coverage, pay with a blank check. Well, this is game over because the American consumers won in the courts. And the hospitals as of January of this first of this year are to post all negotiated rates in an easy to download machine readable and human readable file where anyone can see every single payer, every single plan, negotiated rate, as well as all discounted cash prices. And cash prices are oftentimes even lower than the negotiated rates because the hospital gets its money up front. But we don't have access to that when hospitals don't comply. And what we found is only 5.6% in our report, which I'm happy to submit with my testimony, only 5.6% of the hospitals of those 500 were fully compliant with this new law. And as Mr. Rich said earlier, they've been, some of the New York hospitals have done cost estimator tools. That's only one small facet of this. The most important thing that these hospitals are to comply with is to unleash the actual prices, the actual data in that file, so that any tech innovator any consumer and all of us can be able to have access to know real prices up front. And patients know they benefit when they can get an actual and binding price rather than an estimate. Why? Because binding upfront actual prices are accountable. And estimates are useless because they're merely a range with no accountability to the hospitals for those prices. And patients find the estimate tools do not help them when fighting a bill. However, price discovery and price transparency does. I have to report to you today, and I can submit this as well in my testimony, is we found, we looked at 20 hospitals in the New York state, most in New York City, of which none were compliant fully in with this law. Do know that we know from Health and Human Services, that it only costs a hospital approximate $11,868, which is what the OMB office, the federal OMB office and HHS concluded to post this, these, this data online. So going forward, um, the beauty is, is that we will do another report as of January of next year adding a thousand hospitals to our list. But the foundation to lower the cost of healthcare for all of us is for the New York City officials to weigh in to support that these hospitals must comply with this law. Support to this administration, um, seeking even higher penalties, demand hospital prices from the CEOs and the CFOs of these hospitals, and know that next year, 
as of July 1st, 2022, all health insurance plans also have to show all of their negotiated rates and put it everywhere we have in the health system, the ability for all of us to know actual prices negotiated by each and every plan as well as the historical claims data on what prices actually get paid to the hospitals. Getting access, all of us, to this data will show us what hospitals are actually being paid by these health plans and what we're seeing already from the healthcare hospitals that are posting their prices and those that we can see in the system that are beginning to compete we're seeing huge price variation, not only across hospitals, but we're seeing huge price variation within the same hospitals. In fact, I can report that in New York City, that we saw not just what Cora experienced as a 24,000 average on a vaginal birth, but we saw vaginal births, normal healthy vaginal births coded similarly in the same New York hospital, New York Presbyterian being at 80, $5,000 to an individual patient. We've seen EpiPens priced at a $15,000 amount coming out of a hospital when had the patient not been handed that EpiPen from that hospital, but gotten merely a prescription, they could have gone across the street and gotten it for less than $100. We've helped fight these bills for patients because we can see prices. But we know now patients are also fighting their medical bills when they go in and they search by their plan, what was the negotiated rate and what was the hospital price. Already consumers are winning, but the real power is in all of us as a collective. Self-insured employers through the ERISA law have the right and by law are the fiduciary for the welfare and health benefits of their employees. And just like what happened in the financial services industry, all of the rates and, and, and brokerage fees for retirement funds had to be made transparent. That is in ERISA law. So every self-insured employer can share collectively and demand through a demand letter of their plan to get access now before next July, to get access now to all of the actual negotiated rates by their plans. And there is absolutely no reason why as a collective, we as unions and we as um, nonprofits and businesses can, and even New York City Council can't come together and demand this actual data today and then do the analysis and compare and then forward steer our employees and workers to the best cost of the best quality of care at the lowest possible prices. I thank you for this time today. And I um, think we have a great opportunity that lies ahead in the coming year, in two years, um, putting consumers in the driver's seat and all of us to have the right to have lower cost healthcare, broad access, and it be quite simple through a competitive functional market. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. We're now going to turn to Mark Zezza from New York State Health Foundation. Time starts now. First of all, thank you, Chairperson Rivera and Chairperson Levine and members of the committees for the opportunity to testify before you to discuss hospital prices and healthcare price variation. I am Mark Zezza, Director of Policy and Research at the New York State Health Foundation. The foundation is a private, independent, charitable organization that operates statewide and has the mission of improving the health of all New Yorkers. The foundation, like, like others who have spoken already, believes that information transparency is a gateway to improving affordability, quality, and competition in the healthcare system. You have heard from others about how New York State has been consistently shown to have high healthcare spending in comparison to the rest of the country, with the growth in prices being the main driver of spending levels. Historically, there has been little transparency in prices, and when prices are revealed, we see a great deal of unwarranted variation. In 2016, the foundation funded a study by Gorman Actuarial to investigate the main drivers of price variation within the hospital industry. 
Gorman worked with the state to obtain price data, including the actual negotiated prices, as well as copies of contract provisions between hospitals and health plans. The analysis focused on several markets throughout the state, including the downstate area of New York City, plus Suffolk and Westchester counties. The study found that the highest priced hospitals are 50% to 170% more expensive than the lowest priced hospitals in the same region. And that's on average across all of the different types of services that they offer. And as we've seen in other research in which other people have pointed out, the study found that hospitals with higher prices do not necessarily have higher quality. Rather than quality, the primary factor driving high prices is market share. In general, hospitals that are part of a hospital system with a larger market share were the highest priced hospitals in their county or borough as a result of the power that hospital system has in contract negotiations. This was the case for most of the regions analyzed, including most parts of the greater New York City area, although Manhattan was an exception to this, as was noted earlier. The report also found certain contract provisions that impede healthcare competition and transparency for consumers. These include things like anti-steering language, which can limit the information available about high quality, lower priced providers. These contract terms can compromise a patient's ability to seek out more affordable or better care options. One last finding I will discuss from this study, since the issue of cost shifting has come up earlier, is that hospitals in the downstate region that serve more Medicare and Medicaid patients garner lower prices in the private commercial market. Moreover, hospitals that serve fewer Medicare and Medicaid patients garner higher prices in the commercial market. This pattern Time expired. Con contradicts a widely held belief that a hospital negotiates for higher commercial prices to offset lower reimbursements received for their publicly insured patients. In conclusion, the lack of transparency combined with high and variable prices is anti-consumer. It can lead to higher premiums, uh, higher healthcare taxes, and even higher prices for non-healthcare related goods. Excessively high prices, especially when they come out as a surprise to a patient, can also undermine the patient provider relationship. The lack of transparency also undermines the ability of employers, patients, and other healthcare providers, other healthcare purchasers, excuse me, to shop for more efficient healthcare. Thank you for your attention on this important topic, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for your testimony. We will now turn to Raul Rivera. Um, before I cue the next panelist, I want to make an announcement that if we have inadvertently missed anyone that is registered to testify today and has yet to be called, please use the Zoom raise hand function now, and you will be called on in the order that you raised, your hand has been raised after our next panelist. So thank you, and Raul Rivera, you may begin once you are ready and once the sergeant cues you. Thanks. Time starts now. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Raul Rivera. I'm a Bronx native. Uh, I'm a TLC driver. Uh, I won't be speaking about taxi today, um, but I'm also a, a certified nursing assistant. Uh, I'm not working as one now, but I've worked in the past. Um, I don't have anything written down. I do have some bullet points that I want to bring up, and I'm 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 a little bit. Uh, forgive me if I if I get a little worked up. Uh, I'm really upset. I'm really upset about mandates, and we're talking about access to care, and we're talking about hospital cost. There's no greater uh, injustice to have our frontline workers, our nurses, people who work in the hospital hospitals to be fired, to be forced to take a vaccine that they don't want. We, we have so many elected officials in the city. There's been many freedom rallies against uh, forced mandates and nobody is coming out to speak out or speak for uh, the frontline workers. Um, there's, there's nothing more brave than, than doing what they did. It's, it's incredible the work that they did. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really upset. I, I see a lot of hypocrisy. And uh, if, you're for, if you're for abortion rights, you should be against mandates because it's my body, my choice. They go hand in hand. Nobody has autonomy over your body. Um, I'm trying to get uh, Mr. Eric Adams to uh, let me know what's his stance. We know that uh, co-chair Levine is for mandates. 
um, I think it's pretty, uh, un- it's, it's disgusting really. We, 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 call, we call these frontline workers heroes and today they're zeros. They're being fired and nobody's speaking up for them. I hope I'm able to speak with the council member, uh, Kalina Rivera, when you have some time so we can go over some more of my points. And we need elected officials to speak up for the frontline workers. You have to speak up for them. You, you've been elected to speak for us. You are elected officials. You need to speak for us. You got to defend our rights. I don't know if you guys are doctors, but you can't tell people what to do when it comes to their body. It's freedom over fear. My body, my choice. And we need to end the hypocrisy. We need to stop pandering to the voters. We need to protect our frontline workers. We're talking about access to care. We're talking about hospital cost. What's the cost of losing our workers? There will be no access to care if they continue to get fired. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Seeing no hands raised, um, we will now conclude this panel and I will turn it over to the chairs for closing remarks and statements, starting with Chair Rivera. Thank you so much. Uh, I will just say that healthcare is a human right. This is not a debate and access to affordable care um, is non-negotiable. Um, earlier today, we, we stood with the Coalition for Affordable Hospitals uh, to demand fair hospital pricing because we believe that is the right thing to do for the well-being of all New Yorkers. So I want to thank everyone who testified today and, and gave and, and shared their experiences, but also um, really share their concerns and, and the things that we have to do to make this a more equitable and transparent system. So I want to thank everyone from our, our state elected officials, our labor leaders, advocates, um, and all New Yorkers for, for taking some time to be with us today. And I'll turn it over to Co-Chair Levine before I close this out. All right, well. Sorry about that. I was uh, on mute there. Thank you, Chair Rivera. Uh, I'm in transit, so I'm going to keep the camera off. Apologies. Uh, before I make uh, closing remarks, I, I do. I can't let the statement of our, our final uh, witness uh, go without any response. Um, we make room for the public to speak here, and, and Mr. Rivera, we welcome you taking that opportunity as well. You have the right in this country to uh, refuse treatment for cancer, for a broken leg, uh, for a clogged artery, uh, for better or for worse. If uh, you don't want to take care of yourself for those um, medical problems, that's your right. But none of those conditions are contagious. None of those are conditions will call someone, cause someone who's breathing your air to die. And as elected officials, we have a moral obligation to save the lives of our constituents to prevent unnecessary death. That is what's on the line right now in this pandemic. It's why we mandate vaccines for a whole host of contagious diseases uh, from polio to measles. And, And that has prevented incalculable suffering. It saved millions of lives, lives here in New York City and elsewhere. And uh, it's why we have no choice but to make sure that, uh, particularly in extremely high risk settings like hospitals, that we protect first and foremost staff members, their families and and patients by ensuring that everyone um, who works in those environments is is vaccinated. And there's, at this point, there's uh, real- real, All right, at this point, at this point, there is strong evidence that these these mandates work because uh, the vast majority of staff in hospitals now um, uh, into the mid 90s percent uh, has opted to get vaccinated, which is uh, a great success. But 
just just uh, turning back to our topic today. I mean, my goodness, there was so much powerful testimony. Um, uh, the last panel, uh, uh, for sure, uh, I can't say how impressed I was by um, the information that all of you shared. Uh, I, I remain even more upset now than I was uh, four hours ago. There's just no question that there are indefensible disparities in the prices being charged charge New Yorkers for uh, essential medical care. And that that's leading to costs that are so high that it's impacting workers, it's impacting unions, it's impacting uh, our, our city's budget. And we can't accept it, it has to be fixed. Transparency is a big part of the solution. Um, and we're gonna stay on this uh, with our allies at the state and at the federal level. So uh, thank you, Chair Rivera. Re really a pleasure to co-chair this with you and I'm grateful for your leadership on this issue. Thanks again and back to you. Thank you, Chair Levine. And I, I echo those uh, sentiments on what we have to do um, to make this a more transparent process to be fair to all New Yorkers, especially those who, who truly need these services and the glaring disparities across the city. And, and so with that, I will, uh, adjourn this hearing. I thank you all for being here. The recording is done and this hearing